What's up? We are, uh, we're just hanging out here. I was all set to go and, uh, I figured I would just come on on here and hang out with everybody before the, uh, before the, the real stream started, supposedly. So hopefully everybody's doing good. Uh, anyways, um, yeah. So tonight we're gonna have a little fun show, but, um, you know, I, I, it, we're, we're gonna have to stay on topic. So, uh, it's going to be kind of, uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to push through it you know we're not very good at that here so you know figured uh we could get some of our chit chat out of the way now before uh things get uh, too intense oh boy well, the good news is i uh am off tomorrow um i had a, a fairly easy day here at work and i'm off tomorrow and then a bunch of people are all starting to take vacation. And of course, then it's Thanksgiving week and a bunch of people are out for the whole week. And I'm I'm out uh, for Thursday and Friday. So it'll be pretty, it'll be pretty nice. I think we're gonna, you know, finally be able to catch up with some stuff around here, which is great. What is sucks, what is unfortunate is that um, this Friday, so tomorrow, and then the next two Fridays in a row. Yeah, so the 10th, the 17th and the 24th, uh, Mr. Aaron Smith is out of town, busy with family obligations, holiday obligations, anniversary ob obligations. And so my usual Friday game is is canceled. And of course, you know, we are between games here on the channel. And that means I don't I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have an RPG game for like the next almost month. So I'm definitely going to have to try to. uh to get on that and uh, <laughs> get some games going on uh, the nice last call Patreon because I, I need to play, um, need to run games. You know, I, I am a forever GM, but I am, I am, I've come to accept that that is very much, uh, very much my style. You know, I, I like, um, you know, there's a great line from the show, the West wing which not, maybe not everybody has seen his older, older show at this point. And the president is played by uh, Martin Sheen and his deputy chief of staff is a character named Josh Lyman played by Bradley Whitford. And there's an episode where he is Bradley Whitford. He's, he's like losing his mind trying to, uh, trying to get this bill through and it's just not going to happen. And at the end, he, the president basically says, you know, give it up. And he just looks completely destroyed. And the president says, you know what? I he goes. I I want to be the man. He goes. You want to be the man that the man relies on, and uh, you know I I think that's kind of the things like when it comes to GMing, it's like I want to be the man. You know, I want to take. I want to be the person that takes responsibility for the group. I want to be the one who takes responsibility for knowing the rules, for setting the tone, for doing the extra legwork. Um, I don't mind it, and and in fact, I feel. I feel very powerless, um, especially when I'm playing in a role playing game system that does not have any sort of narrative control. I mean, this is regard like whether I'm talking about fourth edition D and D, you know, which everyone, oh, Derek loves fourth edition D and D, but whether it's fourth edition D and D or old school D and D or anything like that, when I as a player do not have, I, I when I do not have the ability to make a an impactful change to the the story as I see fit, I feel very powerless. Um, I understand some, I think there's a strange amount of pleasure that comes from some people from sort of that level of powerlessness, right? Like you have to work within the system to get it done, which I respect. I, I think it's awesome. I think that's kind of what makes the difference though, between, you know, being a player and being a, uh, a GM, you know, another, another way to think of it is this, I'd rather tell a story, uh, than hear a story. And, uh, certainly throughout my life, especially in my older years, I have tried to work on my listening skills, uh, but you know, I wasn't always necessarily the greatest listener, you know? Uh, no, uh, you are not, no one, you are not uh, late. You are early. This is the pre-stream. So yes, we are just hanging out here, waiting for the actual stream to start. Um, 
Blood Earnest says make a Northman. Blood Earnest, I was actually thinking of doing that. I was either thinking, I know Bob ran a Northman the other day. He said it was a lot of fun. He had a blast. Um, you know, and especially for me, having just come out of doing the level 20 hyper mythic Valax raid for 12 PCs, like just like making it a fun, short little adventure, you know, for, for, you know, combat encounter and some, and some skill checks for just normal PCs at a normal level. Uh, there is a certain amount of appeal to that, but I, I also don't mind the idea of, of making a character as well. Uh, and then you said Brad and uh, Brad and Donna forever. I, I mean, obviously you mean Josh and Donna. <laughs> Brad would be the name of the actor. Donna would be the name of the character, but I'm assuming you mean Josh and Donna. Um, but yeah, that is one of my favorite shows of all time. Blood Earnest. Um, let's see here. Damien says I could try to join him on Monday to play the free Marvel module. I feel like we have something on Monday. I think Monday is our uh, Patreon Q&A, Damien. We had to move it. Um, unrelated uh, to this, You've Got Mail is also one of my favorite uh, films. I really love that. Okay, A Monday, got it. Uh, good evening, Full Metal Dragon. Dragon. There we go. Dragon. It's hard to trill with I. I still have a couple weeks left of my Invisalign. Um, and it's very hard to trill my R's when I have these in. Um. So yeah. Oh boy. So anyways, I was saying I, I have no games. For like the next month, it's crazy. I'm going like stir crazy over here. I, I'm, you know, a lot of people on the Discord uh, are starting to play some 13th Age games uh, with their groups as sort of a, I mean, it's a fantastic game in its own right, but as sort of the intermediate step, perhaps, to a wider gaming world, moving from a strictly sort of, you know, what we think of the as the sort of strict D20, world of D20, into a game that still uses familiar tropes like D20 class level, um, and, uh, that, that, that game is amazing. That's awesome. But I'm also just like, man, they're, I'm like, oh, I like I've played 13th age. I've played it several times, but I'm like, oh man, it would be cool to play 13th age again. And I'm like, no, you have four games over here that you've, you've not even really played other than like uh, maybe a one shot that you really want to get into, you know, Fabula Ultima, uh, Forbidden Lands. I mean, there's just like a, a, a list I still want to finish my Legend of the Five Rings campaign, and it's just no time. It's so frustrating. Um, oh, yeah, and of course, fourth edition. Uh, of course. How could we forget? Uh, you know, Aaron has been really pushing us to start a 4E campaign, and he's like, I want to do the whole thing. I want to do, like, 1 through 30 like we did when we were, you know, 25. It's like, it's uh, a tall order, my friend. I mean, even if you level up every other session, and that's saying something, um, you know, you're still talking about 60 sessions. It's a lot of play. Um, I'm beginning to consider solo play. You know, Claude, boy, I know. I mean, some people I know it's it's awesome uh, for them. And I mean, people, even some people that I didn't think would really get into solo play have really told me, like, uh, they really love solo play rules for games like Starforge, Ironforge, the new Captain's Log for the Star Trek Adventure game. Um but uh, I can't get into it. I can't get into it. RPGs for me are a social hobby. It, I, I cannot, I can't do the solo thing. Um, I, I mean, big, no, I, that is not a knock against it at all. I think it's an incredible, amazing experience. And uh, I, I, I even think that to a certain extent, solo play uh, maybe is appealing to people who maybe in, in another life, you know, wanted to be a writer or, or if I have always had an, an expressive interest in writing um, or, or screenplay writing or something, uh, because a lot of my friends that do enjoy solo RPGs, you know, are essentially, you know, we're, we're writers or, or have thought about writing. And I think that for me, I've never, I've never thought about writing, you know, <laughs> that is not something I, I'd like to do. I, I'm, I'm much more of a collaborator. You know, I want to sit around with a, a group of smart, creative, funny, 
people with really cool ideas. And I just want to, you know, ha hammer shit out. That's that's my kind of style. Shadram coming in there with their 11 month, almost a year with their 11 month adventure chat says so many games, so little times, maybe in the next 11 months, I'll play at least one of the unplayed games on my shelf, but I'll buy a dozen new ones. And, and that's, uh, that is exactly the sad, sad, sad truth there. You know, there's just too many good games. Trey, what is up, buddy? Good to see you. Um, nice to have you here. Uh, yeah, so did this start early? Yes, this is the pre-stream. Welcome to the pre-stream. So we're just hanging out. I missed you guys, you know, all of you. Uh, you all, uh, <laughs> since, when, since when have you been doing stream streams? To be fair, I did not, this, this pre-stream countdown was already set up. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it existed before we did it one other time. Basically it happens when, uh, you know, usually it's cause I, get, I finish up work early and I have plenty of time to take care of the dogs, take them for walks. I don't have to run out. I'm not doing any errands because a lot of times, you know, work ends. I got to take care of the dogs. I run out to get some stuff done before everything closes. Before the stream starts, I come, I'm driving back at like 630 or 635 and I've got to get, you know, I got to get the stream set up and I've got to get the chat log set up and I've got to get my teleprompter set up and I got to get all my lights on. And I'm trying to do that in like five or 10 minutes. And then, you know, I, I, I hit live, but on days like today, I wrapped up work like around you know two o'clock or something, three o'clock. And so uh, I, I basically just been kind of sitting around all day waiting for this stream. Ergo, I had everything ready to go. And I saw that there was like, you know, six or seven or eight people uh, in the waiting room. So why not start? So anyways, I just like talking to you folks, you know. Uh, obviously, you know, I have my close personal friends that I, you know, see and hang out with in real life and, and try to see them every uh, so often. But, uh, you know, by and large, I would say... I talk to you all more than I pretty much talk to anyone else, except for, again, my closest personal friends. Um, you know, I don't really have acquaintances in my personal life anymore. Uh, a combination of, you know, working from home and I, I got a new job. You know, I, I wasn't working when the pandemic started and then I got a new job during the pandemic. And so I pretty much worked remotely my entire career there. It's not a lot of, you know, camaraderie there. And obviously no new friends is just my rule for the last 10 years. Um, so yeah, it's like one of those things where it's just like, I don't, I don't really, you know, I don't really have a whole lot of people that I hang out with because for, you know, Bob and uh, Matt, the cat and uh, obviously Mr. Smith and, you know, some of our friends from our local group that you may have heard before. But other than that, I, I talked to, I hang out to you all. I mean, there are some people in this chat right now, like, like Scott, who just came in. I think I have talked to Scott more this year. If you, especially, I mean, you, days at Origins, days at, at Gen Con. Uh, he stopped by the studio once on our way in to drop off some lighting equipment, some some rigging. I've talked to Scott more this year than I. I think I've talked to most members of my family. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's it's one of those things. It's just interesting. Um, Vin says MCDM Matt Colville released a little thing on two of their classes. The second one actually sounds awesome. I'll have to check it out. Um, obviously I joined his Patreon to literally be sort of follow along the development of his game. And while I do read things occasionally, I'm like way behind on where they are with that type of thing. Uh, do the Knights accept TTRPG PDFs of games they may not have played yet? Uh, no, I don't, I don't necessarily know what you mean by that you mean like if if somebody made like if somebody bought a ttrpg and they want to give it to us or if they made a ttrpg and you want to give it to us uh i don't think that's ever come up before so uh yes no um all right we're, we're about to start this uh we're about to start this this stream for real hmm so there's 20, there's 20 lessons. So if we spend six minutes on each lesson, we will get through it in, in two hours. So that, 
that is that's the key you know that's the key for sure right um <laughs> Uh. Ooh, negative four one one. Coming in with the sponsor. Eight months. Thank you, negative four one one. Great re up. Uh, see, see you guys later. All right, we are we are starting the stream. Hey, we're back. We're starting the stream. Um. <laughs> So, uh, welcome everybody. Tonight, we are going to be talking about not RPG, RPG, RPG. We're going to be talking about 20 lessons from 20 years. Um, and for uh, time is going to be the essence here. We have, a, we have a tendency to ramble. I want to get to the chat. I want to answer your questions. And I also understand here that we're not going to answer, we're not going to solve every problem here tonight. We're not going to, we're not going to, uh, be able to ascertain every glimpse of, of value that comes from this talk. But I do want to tight to introduce you one to an incredible resource. If you are interested in game design as a hobby, as a profession, there is a uh, sort it's sort of the Ted talk of <laughs> it's sort of the Ted talk of, uh, of game design. Um, and it is a, a conference called the Game Developers Conference, right? And the Game Developers Conference is essentially where they invite game designers, usually with a focus on video games, but obviously that's where the money and the market is. But there are some great ones from board game developers and card game developers and the like. And these are people who really know their shit. <laughs> um, you know, we, we get into a lot of debates on Nights of Last Call Patreon about who is and who isn't a game designer. There's a, a popular idea that exists out in the internet that all DMs are game designers. And I respectfully disagree. Uh, I think that there's, I think game design is um, a, a sort of a deliberate creative act that is in blends a variety of skills and subsets of skills. So, um, you know, I basically I'm saying, I think I, that's not to say that you couldn't be a game designer, but I'm just saying that just because you're a DM and you, you know, change the ruling on a monster, I don't think that that makes you a game designer anyways. So a couple years ago now, now it's a couple years old at this point, but, um, you know, about five, six years ago, Mark Rosewater, who is the head of design at Wizards of the Coast Magic the Gathering. He's worked there for over 20 years. He wasn't always head of design, but he's been head of design for a very long time. And Mark Rosewater, to me, is one of, if not the greatest game designer of all time. There's some other board game designers that I consider very high up there. Reiner Knizia is one of them. Uwe Rosenberg is another one. I think they have created some absolutely stunning and amazing pieces of game, um, and, and especially Reiner Knizia. Uh, Reiner Knizia, Tigris and Euphrates, Ra, um, Modern Art, just some incredible, amazing games. Very, not heavyweight, but not lightweight. Like Rainer games are usually the perfect, what I would call a medium weight board game. So if, if you ever want to check out uh, a really great series of board games, pretty much pick up any game by Reiner Knizia. Anyways, Mark Rosewater, to me, has overseen what is arguably the greatest game in history. There is no doubt to me that Magic the Gathering is the most complex game that has ever been created. And yet somehow they continue to innovate, grow, develop, make new, exciting cards and ideas. It, if you had asked me 20 years ago, have we seen everything that you could see out of a Magic the Gathering card? I would say, of course, it's a piece of cardboard. What more can you do with it other than completely redesign the game? And then 10 years ago, uh, I'd have been like, there's, we've done it all. There's no way the game is tapped out. It is intellectually bankrupt. And yet here we are. And a new set comes out tomorrow, uh, lost caverns of Ixalan. And we've got new mechanics. We've got new ideas. We've got new ways of exploring the game space. Um, and it's pretty crazy. Now I used to be a very, 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 um, big magic, the gathering player. Um, I've gone on and off in my life right now. I'm, I'm pretty casual. I, I draft, a little bit, but I used to be like a hardcore, you know, player. I, I played standard. I traveled for tournaments, um, and, uh, you know, tried to 
grind it onto the Pro Tour. So my experience with the game has sort of been all over the place. And one thing that I think has really always impressed me has been the game design. So Mark Rosewater, many years ago, not many, but some years ago, did this conference where he talked about 20 years, 20 lessons learned. So tonight, we are going to go over those 20 lessons, both as just an introduction to you, but also sort of to understand now, of course, he's talking lessons learned while developing Magic the Gathering, a card, a, a collectible card game. But I think these are fairly universal lessons, and I think we can not only apply them as potential would-be game designers of TTRPGs, but also uh, as players or even just as GMs about what matters in a game, right? Um, and so I think I think it'll be an interesting experience, and God's willing, you know, we'll 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 get through it. <laughs> Now, in some instances, we are going to hop over to YouTube, and I'm going to play some clips from his talk uh, at 1.5x speed. Hopefully, that's not too fast for everybody. Uh, I'm a 2x or 3x man myself, but 1.5x, I think, will be fine. We're not going to do that for every lesson, but we are going to do it for some just because I think Mark uh, really does a great job of sort of explaining himself and giving a really good sense of context. Um, let's see here. Hoyrit likes Cole Worley of Root and Oath. I love Root, love it. And I didn't think I could like Oath more than Root. And yet I liked Oath more than Root. I know Root is everybody else's preferred game, but I think Oath is incredible. Cole Worley, he, he doesn't, you know, he needs some more titles under his belt, but he is well on his way. I kickstarted arcs uh, of his, I think, I think that's a Cole Worley game. Um, last year, and I think it's coming out maybe next year. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. If, if, if Arcs, if he goes three for three with Root, Oath, and Arcs, um, Cole Worley would definitely be, uh, uh, you know, on the short list. Uh, Pumpkin has to leave because he's not allowed to watch until he learns by homebrewing first. <laughs> Naturally. Um, I stopped collecting board games, but I still buy every Uwe Rosenberg release. Seeing the evolution of his designs is fascinating. Uh, I'm not going to get into a, a long description here and basically have a conversation just between Shadram and myself. But yes, um, Uwe Rosenberg is definitely a, a person who says, I like this idea. And rather than, you know, create a whole new concept every single time I design a game and reinvent the wheel every single time, I am just going to evolve, 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 evolve the the same basic concept, you know, from Agricola to La Havre to Aura et Labora to Caverna to, you know, so, so on and so forth. So it's really interesting to see his evolution over the years as well. I completely agree. All right. So um, first lesson that we have from, uh, from this list here is fighting against human nature is a losing battle. And so we're going to, uh, let's see what Mark has to say about this. We'll start off with some, we'll start off with some Mark here. Okay, lesson number one. So for this one, we're going back to Time Spiral back in October of 2006. So we had a little uh, mechanic called um, Suspend. And Suspend basically lets you trade time for money, money and magic being mana, of course. So the idea essentially was normally in magic, you cast a spell, it happens right away. But Suspend said, well, it's cheaper, but you have to wait several turns for it. So this is Aaron Ephemeron. It takes four turns once you play it. So you cast it, Wait, wait, wait. Okay, you get Aaron Ephemeron. And then as soon as people got it, they would attack with it. In magic tapping, you, know, you have to turn to attack. So they would attack with it. Um, but they weren't allowed to do that. So just for context here, um, in Magic the Gathering, when a creature enters play or is summoned into play, it has what we call summoning sickness. It's weakened by its tra transverse through the, uh, through the blind eternities, and it can attack. Uh, now, there is an ability in magic called haste, which lets a creature attack or tap uh, the turn it comes into play. But um, this uh, was, this. he's saying that in the original design, these 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 creatures did not have haste. Um, and he is on 1.5x speed, 1.5. Because the magic rules say you can't do that. So we were trying to figure out how could we communicate to people not to attack. I'll so turn, no, we look. tried a lot of different ways. Um, some got less and less subtle to try to encourage them to say, no, you can't attack, you can't attack with this creature. Um, and in the end, the solution was, no, guys, you can't attack. And then finally we said, okay, you can't attack. We'll change the rules. The rules just say you can attack. You, you want to attack, you can attack. So that brings us to lesson number one. Fighting against human nature is a losing battle. So this, I think, is 
particularly interesting um, because, you know, as a game designer, um, I think I think we all understand and, and, and you know, we'll get a, kind of getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but I think we all understand that, like, there are certain natural tendencies that as gamers in a role playing game that we want to see, we want to have happen that some things feel good, some things don't feel good. And as humans, it is our essential nature to want to, uh, you know, have things the way that we want them. And it doesn't matter what kind of player you are. Human nature itself uh, is, a, you know, is, a, is integral to all of us. And fighting against that is almost always a bad idea. And, you know, when you think about uh, TTRPGs, right, I think about, I think about reward structures and I think about what is it that people want out of a game. And there are times when I look at certain role-playing game mechanics or I look at certain role-playing game systems and I say, your game is sort of actively opposed to the thing that, that people are going to naturally want to do. This is the sort of natural expression of what people would want to do with their game. And as a result, I think people can find themselves at odds with the design of the game. They can feel like they're pushing, you know, up skate, uh, ice skating uphill because there's a d fundamental dissonance between what the game is trying to do, what it's trying to be about, and what you want out of the game and what you're trying to do with it, all right? So again, I think this is a kind of a fundamental uh, lesson, but I think it's a, I think it's a pretty uh, important one. All right, let's go back to Mark for the second lesson because I think this one's a really good one. And this is actually one that Derek would, you know, obviously I'm, I'm aware of this talk. Derek would have said this doesn't matter, but you know, Mark, Mark, Mark says it does. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to believe with Mark here. Um, oh yeah. Mass fam. That's a great example of that. Uh, you know, I talked about reward structures, but when we're talking about, you know, human nature, the 10 minute adventuring day is a product of this a hundred percent mass fam, a hundred percent, you know, like if there is a way for your characters or your party to be healed to full and to have all of their resources and there's really no downside to that then yeah of course you're going to go and do that and you might say yeah well the game suffers for that right the game rules the game balance the encounter design the encounter flow and it's like yeah but humans are going to do that they are going to try to mitigate as much of their risk and as much of their loss as they possibly can so all right Okay, lesson number two, aesthetics matter, up on the wall. Lesson number three. Oh, I so skipped, for this one, we go back I to the one. Here lesson I'm going to put up on the board, and at the end, it'll be about Gristle Brand. Oh, here we go. So the card I got the most complaints about was a card called Gristle Brand. In fact, Great card, I got by the way. way more complaints about this card than any other card. Why? Was it a power level issue? Well, no. Here's Jerry Thompson, a very good Magic player. A whole article explaining how awesome Gristle Brand is. Gristle Brand's a very powerful card. In certain formats, it's actually very, very strong. Okay, was it a flavor thing? No. Liliana is one of our most popular characters. In fact, she made a deal with four demons to get eternal uh, youth and, and beauty. And he was one of the four demons she made a deal with. So no, he's super flavorful. So what was going on? Well, he was a seven power creature with seven toughness. You could pay seven life to draw seven cards. And he cost eight mana. <laughs> so lesson number two, aesthetics matter. So... <laughs> um... You know, Gristlebrand is is like is considered to be you know kind of the classic example of this, but like, you know, aesthetics matter, and uh, in role playing games, you know how something is, you know, and again, I love Fourth Edition, but I have heard all the time from people like uh, self confessed cynic here that, um, you know, calling something an encounter power calling something a daily or a solo is aesthetics and, you know, they matter and, you know, how something looks and how something presents and wanting a certain degree of symmetry and patterns and completeness. And, you know, there are many, many times where like think, you know, like we were recently going over, um, the cleric class from the Pathfinder 2 remaster and Mark Seifter commented about how you have this series of feet trees that are all tied to like moment of prescience or something. I can't remember the exact feet name, but it gives you an aura. And 
one of the auras is like a, all, a bunch of the auras are 15 feet. And then randomly, one of the auras is 20 feet. Now, I get it. That could just be a minor detail. Somebody put 20 feet instead of 15 feet. But when all the rest of them are 15 feet and one of them is 20 feet, it, it, it just it sticks out like a store thumb. And, you know, aesthetics. So aesthetics matter. And aesthetics means more than just, you know, what does this look like? It's how does it feel? You know, and this is something we'll get to when we get to lesson five. It's something that we've talked a lot about here recently. But this idea that sometimes it's not about whether or not something is, uh, you know, I, I think the best of both worlds is when something, you know, is powerful and it also feels powerful, right? And by powerful, I, I and by that, to that sec, you know, by, and for that reason, I should say, and it's fun, but it's also not broken, right? And like, that's like a very tough thing to hit. That's a very tough target to hit. But a lot of times you read something, you look at something and you might say, wow, this is really cool. This is very important. This is very powerful, right? But but you read it and you go, maybe actually, maybe it's not, but it looks really cool. It looks really powerful. But then there's also RPG powers where you say, uh, you know, like a classic example of this was in uh, third edition, right? Weapon focus gives you a plus one bonus to hit. It is completely boring. It's very powerful because bonus to hit is everything. But it's like flavorless. It's dead. It has no, you know, there's no aesthetics to it. It's just a really boring mechanical feat. Um, and so, you know, having these aesthetics be part of your game, I think, is a really, really important part uh, of the game. So uh, that's that's our second lesson. And then let's go over to Mark for the third. Okay, lesson number two, aesthetics matter, up on the wall. Lesson number three. So for this one, we go back to Innistrad and Dark Ascension. This is back in 2011, 2012. So this was our gothic horror sets. We cool have set. vampires and werewolves and zombies. So one of the things I did very early in this design team is on the whiteboard, we wrote up just cool sounding names, just things that sounded evocative. And then a lot of the cards, a lot of the popular cards from the set came from that whiteboard that we would put things up and we would design to match it. And we ended up with a lot of very evocative cards, some of the favorite cards in the set. And it all came from just matching the idea of what sounded cool, what would make a cool sounding card. So that gets us to lesson number three. Resonance, resonance is important. I'm just going to let okay, him so talk here a little metaphors. bit. So one of my metaphors is humans, your audience, the people going to play your games, come preloaded. Designers don't have to start from scratch. That the audience already has pre-existing emotional responses that the game designer can build upon. For example, Magic didn't invent zombies. Players came to the game with a pre-built emotional relationship with zombies, created from years of watching pop culture. So Magic was able to build on that knowledge and make a rich emotional game experience. Your audience has a deep deposit of emotional equity in pre-existing things, and as game designers, that's a tool you should make use of and build upon. So lesson number three, resonance is important. The key to remember is your audience comes to your game with a lot of stuff already there. As a game designer, use that. Build upon it. That it's, I'm going to talk a lot today about you're trying to create emotional responses with your audience. Well, they, they come with emotional responses built in. You as game designers should take advantage of that. All right. So, uh, again, I, I think Mark said that particularly well, so that's why I let him just kind of do the whole thing here. So, resonance is important. And, um, you know, this is something I think... Uh, you know, ga game designers really try to sort of uh, take advantage of, and I don't always know that it works out as well as you should. Um, and, you know, uh, it's like monsters, like as an example, okay? I I I've seen this before, okay? Have you ever seen this in my, in you ever see this in Pathfinder 2? I've seen this in Pathfinder 2. There's a creature and it's a big, it's a big heavy creature and it's maybe wearing heavy armor. And you think, surely this creature must have a bad reflex safe. And then it doesn't, right? To me, this is an example of where you're sort of, not only are you not taking advantage of resonance, you're also spitting in its face. I'll give you another example. I, re I remember this very clearly. This is a classic Aaron Smith throwing his hands up in the air. What are we even doing here moment? This was back from third edition. It might have been Pathfinder 1, but I think it was third edition. And the group was entering the ruins of a dungeon, but this was uh, 
uh, above the dungeon. So before they discovered the stairs down and in the rubble or the ruins, there was some overgrown things and uh, there was an assassin vine. Okay. And an assassin vine went and grabbed Aaron and, you know, it's a living plant creature and Aaron's grappling and he's doing this stuff and he's got this dwarf fighter with a bunch of stuff. And he, Aaron goes, okay, I'm going to, while I'm grappling, I'm going to try to get free and I'm going to try to get out my alchemist fire and like, just like set myself on fire. Sure. I'll take a bunch of damage. This is very, very clearly a D and D story, right? I'll set myself on fire. That's a good tactic. Um, but you know, being figuring, right. It's a plant wood plants, fire burning, like every game we've ever played has made us feel like fire is probably a good idea against plants. And this creature inexplicably had fire resistance 10, like in the book, like that's not just like a Derek thing. Um, and so it, it, it felt wrong. It felt bad. Right. And so I think there's an, there's a, there's this idea of an expectation of how things should work. And, you know, um, Ayla says, you know, this is verisimilitude. There's a certain element to that. But I think, I think, you know, you see this in Pathfinder second edition. I do, uh, not just Pathfinder second edition. I'm, I'm just talking about that game specifically a little bit, but like when someone casts a lightning bolt, we expect it to be like we as human beings we all come preloaded with an idea of what lightning does and what electricity is and so why instead of denying that right like instead of fighting that i think your your game works better and this by the way isn't just for game designers this is just even as a gm when these effects these monsters these spells these abilities all sort of work the way you expect them to work. Not only are you giving a better game experience to your players, but you're also allowing, you know, you're, you're, you're allowing some, a lot of their preloaded information about how things work to sort of take over in the game. Um, you know, I, 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 I'll give you an example of anti-resonance. There are, I could be wrong here. There are a number of kineticist powers that use electricity that get a bonus to attack people who are wearing metal armor, right? I think that's cool. Or wearing made predominantly of metal or principally of metal or something like that, right? I think that's really cool. But lightning bolt doesn't work that way and neither does chain lightning. So it's just kind of one of those instances where this resonance is sort of being, you know, not really respected and it's sort of ignored and it can create, you know, not instead of the opposite of, I suppose the opposite of resonance would be dissonance and it feels strange. It's not even just a matter of whether it feels like it's a real world or not, or, you know, is it, uh, you know, anything like that. It's more of just like, I feel like all of the expectations, all of the knowledge that I have as a human being living in the world is kind of actually maybe hurting me. It's kind of working against me a little bit. I need to like, you know, unlearn what I have learned. And that's a, that's a really tough, it's a really tough ask to ask from your players. Um, <laughs> uh, mass fam, you know, if only there were a trait system, uh, that, uh, it could have helped with that, you know, mass fam, I think, um, you know, I think that uh, in real world, Harmer would act like a Faraday cage. I think that's only true, though, Hoyrit, if it had easy access to ground, right? Like if the armor was grounded, then I think it would act as a Faraday cage. But, you know, again, but that see, like we're now we're, we're talking about it. Like people are like, but this is a game and it shouldn't do that. OK, I mean, there's a there's a line uh, between, you know, when something gets a little bit, you know, too far. But um, anyways, I think that this is something that uh, as an example is, is really, really um, important. Uh, Shadram says Baldur's Gate three did that. Well, electricity does extra damage if the target is standing in water and chains to anything else in the water. I, I love this. And as an example, in our dread in the dark and dragons game, which we played on Halloween with Vin and Vin was playing on Magus gunslinger, even though it was not actually D and D, um, they entered a level of castle Ravenloft where the hallway was flooded and they were fighting a bunch of creatures and, uh, Vin, Vin's Magus shocking grasped the water and it, you know, it electrocuted and destroyed, you know, it hurt and damaged all the creatures in the water. And now that may not even be the 
scientific, you know, this is where someone goes, well, scientifically, that's not what electricity does. That doesn't matter. That's how everybody thinks it should work, right? Resonance isn't always about what actually happens. It's about what people expect to happen and what people think is going to happen and sort of, you know, leaning, leaning into that. So I think that's, uh, I think that's important. All right. Okay. Up on the wall. Keep going, Mark. Lesson number four. So for this one, we go to Theros from just a couple years ago. One, so my, one of my favorite sets. Greek mythology inspired set. It had us sort of following, you know, lots of cool ideas from Greek mythology. So one of the cards in the set was called Trojan Horse. Um, and the idea of the card was you would give it to your opponent and then every, uh, every turn, a soldier would pop out of it. Trojan Horse. Now, there's no Troy in the game because we had our own world. We, our, our version of Troy was called Akros. So it was called a Crowan Horse, not Trojan Horse. Um, and we play tested with it and it was really popular. The players really liked it. Um, but then the creative team decided to make one small change. Uh, instead of being a horse, we've done horses, let's make it a lion. Let's make it a crow and lion. So we changed the card, and then I started getting complaints in playtesting. The people, they didn't like the card. They didn't understand the card. They were really confused. Like, what, what is this card doing? So we changed it back to a crow and horse, and then everybody liked it again. <laughs> so lesson number four is to make use of piggybacking. So resonance has another valuable use. It's a teaching tool for game mechanics. So, and we're, I'm going to let Mark continue to talk here because I just think that this is a, 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 just a really great lesson. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, again, this is kind of building off of this idea, which is, you know, when things work the way that you expect them to do, your players will then take the next logical step and they will, they will feel that sense of like, oh, I don't need to learn how this works. I already know how this works. Um, you know, Sigma says, I think the Book of the Dead player archetypes majorly failed in the resonance category. And Sigma Y, I think you're right. We understand that for game balance purposes, right? You're, you know, you're undead. You, you, you know, I should be immune to poison and I should be immune to disease and I should be immune to this and I should be, you're right. I should, I should be an undead. I should have all of the immunities and things because that is a sunsh essential nature of what it means to be undead. But obviously that's fairly powerful and broken. I'll give you another example, right? A game book I really respect is uh, Roll for Combat's uh, Battle Zoo Ancestry's Dragon. You're a dragon. You get to play as a dragon. But you you can't fly. Why? Because it's Pathfinder 2 and being able to fly at level 1 would be really, really, really problematic. So you can't fly. Um, and so... They, you get it much later on, but you see a creature, you pick an ancestry, you have wings and you think, oh, this creature has wings. It should fly. And when it doesn't, you have this, uh, you have this dissonance, right? And I think that's what, you know, we're really trying to, I think, avoid here. So it makes use of something I call piggybacking. And what piggybacking is, is the use of pre-existing knowledge to front load game information to make learning easier. So for example, in magic, we have a mechanic called flying. It is the easiest mechanic to teach. Because all I have to say is, you know, like it flies, you know, that it matches it, that, that I don't have to teach a lot of the rules because it does, even though in a vacuum, it ha there's rules with it, but it so matches expectation. It so matches what people already know that it's easy to learn. So now I'm going to give my, my one non-magic example today from Plants vs. Zombies, designed by a guy named George Fan, also is a magic player. Um, so this he was trying to make a tower defense game. So the idea is that things are attacking and you have units you're putting to stop the attacks. Um, but one of the key things is once you place a unit, you can't move it. And George didn't like the fact that normally like, they'd be soldiers. It's like, well, if my soldier is right here and right next door, I definitely need the help. Why won't the soldier just go right next door and help you? Why, why is that the case? So he's like, could I pick something? Could I pick something to be my units that the audience won't think they can move? And so he chose plants. Plant. It can't move. It's in the name. It's planted. And so he chose it so that people would realize, oh, well, once I plant my plant, I have no expectation the plant's going to get up and move anywhere. Also, he needed invading forces. He needed something that kept coming in waves. So he chose something that represented that, that people would expect the zombies to slowly come and come in waves. So a lot of people think, oh, he just picked two funny things. Oh, oh, they're plants. Haha, -ha, they're zombies. But no, he carefully picked them because the choice reinforced the game, that by choosing those, people understood the game easier and faster. So remember, you don't have to teach players things they already know. So lesson number four, make use of piggybacking. All right. So this is where I will get a little fourth edition -y on you. Um, so we have expectations of just what people are, what people should do, what people, how characters should act and how game action should, you know, occur and how they should feel, um, you know, uh, uh you know, how they should, uh, how they should respond. And, and I, and I'll use an exact, exact example of this. 
when we played uh, Rise of the Rune Lords, our buddy Nick, who had never played any role playing game before ever, you know, shout out Nick. Uh, shout out to uh, Big Vance, Vance the Badger. But uh, this was Escanor, and Nick's experience was, you know, Lord of the Rings and anime, and you know th that was pretty much about it. So he wanted to make the knight character, the cool protective knight character. So naturally he went to champion and of course, you know, he picked up a sword and he picked up a shield and the, sh you know, th this was like, I want to be the defensive knight guy. But of course, as so many of us know, if you really want to be the, the defensive knight character, right? You need to go with the captain America build and you need to put away that silly sword and just run around with a bare hand so that you can grapple people and you can do stuff like that. To me, this is an example of where there's this, you know, you're not taking advantage of the piggybacking. We are used to seeing these, you know, heroic knight characters who run around with a sword and a shield. Um, and, you know, you get to Pathfinder 2nd Edition in particular, and the sword sucks. <laughs> it's like one of the worst weapons in the game. Um, you know, may maybe the sword has a little bit of a shot now because it, it makes the target off... Uh, off guard for a turn without a save, but my guess is uh, it might not be. But you know, it, it's the it's uh, most people would say it's not a great weapon. Um, but that that's what people come to fantasy. That's what Excalibur is. That's what you know, Stormbreak like Stormwind is. Like that, that's what uh, uh, Black Razor is. These are the finding tropes of fantasy. But then you get to Pathfinder too. Go, eh, it's not really that great of a weapon. You should really check out this gnome this gnome yo yo, right. Or, uh, or this this flail, and you're like, flail? And you're like, oh, yeah, dude, flails are, that's it. I mean, when you think fantasy, you think Lord of the Rings, right? You're thinking about that flail that the Aragorn and Boromir were using. So I think that there are these essential concepts and traits that we have all sort of expect, you know, have these expectations. And, you know, we should take advantage of those. We should not fight against those. We should piggyback on those. And where I was saying about the fourth edition being an apologist, I think fourth edition did this really well with rolls. Okay. Sauron used a big mace. Okay. I'm okay with the hammer. I've never been a problem with the hammer. It's the flail that no one uses a flail. I think war hammers, big maces, um, I think are totally fine. Um, <laughs> uh, I also totally remember the Witch King's flail. All right, fair enough. Y you know, you would. He uses it for exactly five seconds and uh, then dies. So, you know, good on him. Um, you know what, though? You're absolutely right. And I could totally see that thing. Uh, that That is a legitimate way that I could see somebody being knocked prone if you got critically hit by that thing. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just think that 4th uh, Edition did a great job of this because it used terms and words that as a GM and as a player generally uh, you could understand, you know, Aaron talks a lot of, on this channel. We've always talked to, you know, in this channel about when you play a fifth, when you play a fourth edition game and you're a game master and you see your monsters that are in an encounter and you say, Oh, this creature is a brute. That is its role. Oh, this creature is a soldier. That's its role. Oh, this creature is a lurker. This creature is a skirmisher. This creature is a uh, artillery. That is taking advantage of the fact that these words and these terms mean something to us as humans. And, you know, it's not always a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. It not, doesn't eliminate all cognitive thought processes. But generally speaking, you're going to be able to read these things and go, I know how, to, I know how this works, you know? And, in, you know, Mark was talking about flying being one of the most common things in magic, right? And what's funny about this is there's uh, some cards in Magic the Gathering that people will call, you know, like see a uh, uh, fake flying or secret flying. And basically it's when like the card art or the card itself, uh, like the name of the card, like when you hear Sarah Angel, uh, we understand angels have wings, wings give you flight. So when the Sarah angel flies, it feels very, very, very resonant and it piggybacks on our existing knowledge of angels. But sometimes in Magic the Gathering, you'll have a creature and it'll be called like ghostly apparition, right? And we just think of ghosts and apparitions and we think, oh yeah, this thing flies, right? Because ghosts fly, but then like it doesn't fly. And you know, there, there have even been games where I've attacked with creatures that did not have flight 
and nobody blocked them because they could have, but they didn't because they didn't really even think that they could because you're just, oh, that creature name is ghostly apparition and it's, it's type is summon spirit. And of course those creatures fly. Why wouldn't it fly? Um, yeah. A secret reach is another example. I mean, flight's a little bit more common for people to understand, but reach is an ability that allows a land-based creature to interact with and block a flying creature. But sometimes there are, and it'll say reach on the, it'll say reach on the card, but there'll be a creature that inexplicably has reach. And you don't know, you don't know why it does have reach. They probably threw it on there for some balance reason, but if it doesn't have it, you're like, uh, this is a little bit of a problem. Whereas for example, in magic gathering, if there is a creature that is a spider, it almost always has reach. Why? Because that's what spiders do. They spin webs and they catch flies, right? So this is an example of like piggybacking to the max of where something works uh, the way that you expect it to work. And I think it's, uh, I think it's very, very, very valuable. Speaking of fourth edition, have you heard of Valor? I got to play it for the first time in between the escalation by building Valor and its approach-based challenge roles. It sounds right up your alley. I have not heard of valor i know there's a new game called uh orcus which is like supposed to be like an attempt at a retro clone um all right this uh this next lesson is probably one of the most important ones that we'll get to tonight here that resonance not only will it emotionally attach your, your audience, it also is a, a rule, for, it's a tool for teaching, that you can use it to help people get your game quicker and faster. That flavor, while it definitely has an emotional appeal, can help you with mechanics. So put it up on the wall. Lesson number five. So for this one, we go back to Odyssey, back in September 2001. So in Magic, there's a, this is an idea called card advantage. Uh, it is a strategic thing that people learn as they get better at the game. So in, I'm doing a very abbre abbreviated version of this for people to understand, actually understand card advantage. The idea is if in my hand and in play, I have more cards than you have, okay, then I, I have an advantage. If I have more cards than you, strategically, I'm at an advantage. So we were doing Odyssey, and I said, okay, well, what if I could turn card advantage on its head? So for example, there's a card called Patrol Hound, where you could discard a card from your hand to give it an ability. But it didn't matter. You didn't care what it got. You didn't want the ability. You just wanted to discard cards from your hand. Well, why would you want to do that? So there was a mechanic in the set called Threshold. And what Threshold said is, when you got seven cards in your graveyard, things would change. So for example, the Crows and Beast, which is a 1-1, one, one, became an 8-8. Eight, eight. So the idea was, if you had seven cards in your hand, you could discard them all to the Patrol Hound to give your Crows and Beast and make it a 1-1 one, one into an 8-8. Eight, eight. How did that go over with the audience? <laughs> the problem was, yes, you could... You could make them do that, but they didn't want to do that. You know, instead of throwing away their entire hand, they'd rather, I don't know, play the cards in their hand. So at least a lesson number five. Don't confuse interesting with fun. We've said this so a lot. two different types of stimulation. There's intellectual stimulation. So, hmm. Now, as he goes into this part, okay, I want you to think about, and again, I know a lot of my audience is Pathfinder 2 based. Um, but I mean, I'm sure this is true of, you know, fifth edition and other games as well. But uh, Pathfinder 2 is the game that we're certainly you know, very familiar with over here. I want you, as he goes through this description, I want you to think about the difference between playing Path Builder, and by that I mean sitting around at home, talking on forums or the Discord, talking about uh, ideas for a character, building out a character to level 20, putting those feats down, you know, that you're going to take it 8 and you're going to take it 10, you're going to take to 12, and then contrast that with actually sitting at the table and you're level one or two and you know, or whatever, you've just started the campaign and you're actually playing the game. All right. So there, there's two different types of stimulation. There's intellectual stimulation. So, Hmm. Interesting. And there's emotional stimulation. <laughs> Fun. Those are different things. So for example, in magic, looking at the cards is intellectual stimulation. Oh, wait, let, let me see what they do. And let me, mm, that's interesting. And what, how are they design the set? And there's playing with the cards, but that's more about emotional. Like, oh, is it fun? Am I having fun playing this? So we tend to think of ourselves as intellectual creatures, but we tend to make most of our decisions based less on facts and more on emotion. So your game can speak to your audience on an intellectual level, or it can speak to them on an emotional level. Now, both are valuable, but when you speak to the players on an emotional level, you're more likely to create player satisfaction. So lesson number five, don't confuse interesting with fun. Look, when we talk about why we make games and what we want the audience to get out of the game, it's an emotional response. You know, we talk about fun, and maybe you're trying to create other emotions. There's games that do things other than produce fun, but you want to get some emotional response out of your audience. So 
there's a difference between being interested and being fun. And make sure that you're not confusing the two because being fun more gets the result that you want. So put it up on the board. So, yeah, so this is uh, obviously, I think, a, a probably one of, you know, for me, one of the biggest and most important lessons that we can, uh, you know, get as we go through this, uh, you know, process here, which is don't confuse interesting with fun. And the fact of the matter is, um, you know, uh, you know, Vin 100% here says don't confuse interesting with fun is a big thing to remember in designing combats too. And, and I complete, and I am guilty of that as I am, as anybody else here, right. Where I am so obsessed with creating a puzzle, right. An intellectual challenge, right. For my party, to, you know, where, cause I'm sitting here and when I'm thinking about the design of say a combat or a class or a feature, I'm in a very intellectual space. I'm in a very, you know, head space. I'm thinking about it from a strictly intellectual perspective. And, you know, I'm not saying that everybody who plays RPGs is a genius, but you know, it's a cerebral game. It's a cerebral hobby. I think it tends to attract people who enjoy intellectual challenges and enjoys intellectual stimulations. And in fact, I think, and I, and I, I'm speaking to this from experience, personal experience. Okay. I'm being honest with you. There are times when sometimes where I think I enjoy the, the, the planning of an RPG session, the creation of a creature, the, the fine tuning of a magical item, right? More than I actually enjoy playing the game. And the reason is because when I get there and I'm actually engaging in whatever game system I'm talking about, the emotional payoff isn't there. It, it's, it's all just an intellectual payoff. And I will be 100% honest with you. When I ask my players, whether it's a new player who is like a kid in the candy store, like Bob, right, to my old jaded grog nerds like Aaron, when I ask them what sessions really grabbed them, it is by far almost never the one that was like that time we, you know, really stacked our bonuses and we took good advantage of our feat synergy and we did all this other stuff. Um, no, the, the games that really stuck with them were the ones that felt emotionally stimulating, you know. Feeling things in this life can be tough, right? You know, there's, there's so much bad going on and uh, in the world and, and things are so tough for people. So anything that we can do to like create a emotionally enjoyable experience is, is so valuable and it just stands out so much. Um, you know, Vin saying a lot of wacky hacks for PF2E have this issue too. That's correct. A lot of the people that make hacks for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, some like, you know, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm not gonna like, try to toot my own horn here, but, uh, cause I'm guilty of this too, but they're making those decisions because they're like, I want to make this more interesting. I want to make this more of a puzzle. I want people to have to figure out, you know, what's the right choice to make here or what's the, you know, whatever contrast that with Derek, uh, my house rule, one of my house rules, one of my hacks for PF2 is I changed the training, uh, the aid rules. And the way I changed the aid rules was I got rid of the die roll. And if you want to aid somebody, you just say on your turn, you spend an action, you prepare aid. You basically say, I'm going to, you know, keep my eyes out and look for an opportunity to help out the barbarian, help out the fighter, uh, help out the rogue. And then at some point on their turn, you can spend a reaction and just describe how very quickly, how you're using your arcana and how you're using your whatever in order to assist the party member. And they get a plus one, plus two, plus three, or plus four bonus, depending on whether you are a trained expert master of legend. Now, why did I do that? Is that to make it more interesting? No, I did it because to make it more fun. I, I, I specifically was looking for something I, I, exactly. Ayla, you are a hundred percent right. Actually, my rule is not interesting. It isn't interesting. Actually, it's really quite boring on a certain weird way of like intellectually, right? There's no, there's no like figuring out what are the odds? Do we really need this? I am specifically making it less interesting but because I think it makes it a lot more fun. And not only does it make it more fun because you know I'm helping somebody, I'm guaranteed to help them, I'm never gonna hurt them. But more important, and I've talked about this a lot, when it's someone else's turn, I don't wanna steal the spotlight for them. You know, And rolling dice is a big thing in d and I don't want other people, other PCs, they already had their turn. Why do they get to roll dice on my turn, right? That, that, that feels like that's kind of taking away 
from their experience. So this is 100% a rule that I made because I was trying to think about the fun. Now, let's be clear here, right? Um, you know, if you have something that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, boring over here, boring over here, and fun over here, and then you have something that is, um, you know, uh, or I, should, I don't know, maybe not fun, fun, whatever, and then you have something over here which is like dead simple, duh, easy, dumb, or something that's really intellectually stimulating, right? There's sort of an X, Y axis here. Of course, if we can find something that is both interesting and fun, right, that that can be like, that's the holy grail. And I think, I think everybody would say that that is where games hope to go, where you can create a interesting experience that is also fun. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, and, and Claude giving me some props here says, I think that the clocks in frozen flame that I did had the best of both worlds, that they were interesting and fun. And I, I like to think that they were, in fact, in general, Claude, I think clocks, one of the reasons I think people across many spectrums keep going back to clocks is because I think that they are interesting, but I also think there's a, an element of them that is essentially fun. Um, and in the case of frozen flame, I, you know, tie those clocks very specifically to the, the, the broken tusks and the tribe. And so it made it interesting, but it was also fun. How can we interact with these clocks? What are the choices that we are making? Oh, we did something good. We hunted down the, you know, we hunted those extra, uh, uh, you know, we hunted down those extra animals or we discovered this cache of food or we tamed this, you know, pack of wild beasts. So we get to tick those resources up and we, we come back feeling very satisfied. And I think that that is a very fulfilling, uh, you know, feeling. And I think, you know, a lot of my experiences um, sometimes with uh, modern D20 games leave me feeling a little, a little empty. You know, I feel intellectually stimulated. But I don't feel emotionally stimulated. Does that make any sense? And again, this could just be me and my problem, right? Um, uh, my primary goal of house rules is, you know, game feel. Uh, another way to look at it, though, is where it moves where the... Uh, another way to look at it, though, is that it moves where the interesting is into the game, i.e. no longer mechanically interesting, it becomes interesting in use. Well, I, again, I think it's important that your game also be somewhat interesting, right? There are a lot of things that are fun that, you know, aren't really that interesting. You know, most party games fall into this category. And I get it. Those those are definitely fun and people will play them. But, you know, RPGs typically are something that you're going to play for a very long time. In fact, I would argue a lot of one-shot RPGs, you know, Honey Heist, Lasers and Feelings, they're very fun games, but they're not particularly interesting because there's not a lot of meat on the bones, Right. And there's not a lot of replayability there. They're not designed for that. You know, I sometimes think, you know, games like Pathfinder 2, you know, they they chose they chose more things that were interesting, maybe than than necessarily were fun. So, uh, you know, that is something that I, I, I will, you know, sometimes critique again, not all, not all the time, not every single thing, but there's plenty of instances, um, you know, how you do that. And I agree. Henry, it does come down to how, you know, you have to know your players, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people, Mark, Mark will get to this in his speech, but there's a lot of people who will go, and, and we all are guilty of this, right? Where you go, uh, well, this path or this set of actions is the most boring set of actions ever, but it's what's going to make me win the easiest. So that's what I'm going to do. I know it's not fun, but because I'm an intellectual person and I know that this is the optimal path to victory, I am going to just choose it anyways, because I'd rather win while not having fun than lose while having fun. Does that make some sense? So we'll, we'll get ahead to it. We're, we're falling. We were doing so well and now we're falling, we're falling a little bit behind on the time. So we're going to catch back up. All right. Um, Lesson number six, back to Indistride, our gothic horror set, remember with the vampires, werewolves, and zombies. So I was the lead designer of the set, and I was trying to figure out what exactly we wanted the set to do. So what I did is I thought back to the pop culture that inspired this, you know, where the audience would get their resources from, where would they think about the, the horror genre, and that's movies and TVs and books. Um, and what I realized was, if I sort of followed the guideline of the source material, I knew what I wanted out of my audience. 
fear. That when you look at the horror genre, that it's about scaring the audience. It's about creating a sense of terror, a suspense, of dread. If you want to see real dread, check out <laughs> Dread in the Dark and Dragons. Very, 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 very scary, fear-inducing, dread-like game. So when I built the set, I actually built mechanics with that in mind. So for example, normally in Magic, we only have one face, but we did a double face card, cards that had stuff on both sides. So one side could be a human, and the other side is a, is a scary werewolf. Or it could be Dr. Jekyll, on the back it was Mr. Hyde. Or it could be a scientist messing with things he shouldn't be messing with, and on the back it's the fly. We also had a mechanic called Morbid, that things happened when creatures died, so all of a sudden death became kind of scary, because you never quite knew what was going to happen. And we had a mechanic called Flashback, which would have spells happen again. That once things are in the graveyard, they could happen again. So you can make 13 zombies and then flash it back and make 13 more. So lesson number six is understand what emotion your game is trying to evoke. To be successful with your game, you need to know what your audience is trying to experience. What emotional response are you trying to create? In order to know what to put into your game, you have to understand what comes out. So you must continually ask yourself, what impact will this game choice have on the player experience? And if it doesn't contribute to the overall experience, it has to go. So back to college, I took a lot of classes in college. Uh, this time I took a screenwriting course, and the teacher taught me something that really stuck with me. So I talked about no scene is worth a movie, no line is worth a scene. So what that means is, no matter how good a scene is, if it's not serving the larger, larger movie, it has to be cut. And the same holds true for a line. If the line doesn't serve the scene, <laughs> you need to cut it. That the idea behind this whole thought was, it doesn't matter how good your line is. If it doesn't enhance the scene, get rid of it. It doesn't matter how good your scene is. If it doesn't enhance the movie, get rid of it. So the same applies to game design, because everything in the game has to contribute to the emotional output you're trying to create. If not, it has to go. So lesson number six, understand what emotion your game is trying to evoke. Like, once again, the theme of today is your, humans are emotional creatures. You are trying to get a response out of them. Think about what emotion you're trying to get, and then make sure your game is moving in that direction, that all your components are trying to get the emotional response you're trying to get from your audience. All right, so, you know, I think this one is, uh, is, is kind of self-explanatory uh, in a way, but, um, you know, we could kind of take this to a, a broader perspective as well, something we talk a lot about on this channel, is, um, you know, uh, what what is your game trying to do? You know, wh what emotion, what what sensation, what feeling, what what is the game's point, right? Well, what are we even trying to do here, right? Um, and, you know, we, you know, and, and, you know, vice versa, you know, this kind of gets to the big three, the questions that whenever we do our first look streams, um, you know, we talk about these all the time, which is, you know, what is your game about? And what, how do the mechanics reinforce that? How do the mechanics of the game actually create the experience that the game says that it is about? And then the third is if, if they players do that, how does the game reward them? Right? So what is the thing? How do you do the thing? And, you know, what do you get if you do the thing? And I think this is a place where a lot of games come up short, quite frankly, um, because, you know, and again, Mark, Mark's going to get into it as we go through this, but like, you know, uh, there are a lot of instances where we understand again, what a game should feel like. And again, I'm, I'm going to use fourth edition here as an example, just cause we've been talking about it recently. Um, you know, there are powers and abilities and things of this nature that in fourth edition, fourth edition is not a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination, but they definitely understood that they said, look, your character is the striker. Your character is the defender of the party. Here is this power. Forget if it's powerful, forget if it's effective, <laughs> it's going to draw all the enemies around you next to you. You're going to spin around in a circle. You're going to hit all of them and they're not going to be able to like move next turn. That makes you feel like a defender. Um, and it makes you feel like you are doing the thing that you, you know, are sort of trying to come out to do. So I think, you know, some games I think struggle because they either don't know what they're about or they say that they're about something. Our game's about heroic fantasy and then they come up short, right? They don't have the tools and the mechanics in order to sort of to, to, to deliver on that. Um, you know, as, as an example, uh, you know, you think about people always talk about horror and, and horror games. And it's like, you know, if you put horror into Pathfinder second edition, or if you put horror into D and D fifth edition, um, yeah, I mean, like it, we can we can have all the you know the things over there. We're trying to create the emotional aspect of it, but you saw what Mark was talking about there. Creating making making Innistrad scary wasn't just about 
putting werewolves on the cards. It wasn't just about putting black cats on the cards. It was about creating mechanics like dual face cards, the morbid mechanic, the flashback mechanic, right? That tied into death and dying and moments of surprise um, that would come out of the game because they understood that, right? Mechanics are setting as, as Ben likes to say, right? As Luke Crane likes to say. So the, what you are putting into your game is, is a direct connection to how, you know, something actually feels right. And I think that that is, I think that's an important, you know, uh, take. Uh, I missed a couple, some chats, but we're not going to have a chance. Again, but I will say Mario Party is horrible. Um, somebody said it best. Uh, they said, duh, 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 duh. damn it. They basically said, um, <laughs> Mario Party mini games are fun. Mario Party the game is terrible. And that is 100% accurate. Um, oh, there it was. It was Shadrum. Yeah. So that is exactly how I feel about Mario Party as well. Um, Hey, GM Scott, thank you for our first tip. GM Scott tip $25. This is a great, informative stream. I watched that video last week, but it's good to hear your additional perspective. Here's for taking holidays off. <laughs> I'm not giving you extra money. You'll have to move it yourself. All right, so uh, uh, GM Scott uh, alluding to um, my, uh, my, my set of goals here. I uh, <laughs> actually have a super chat goal which is to take some time off at the holidays from streaming um but he, he's having me shift it over even though he tipped me because he doesn't want youtube to get their unnecessary cut um steven from roll for combat of course is here uh you know big dicking us as usual uh by saying he was actually at this talk so uh yeah, that's awesome this is i think one of the the legend most legendary uh, game design talks of that has ever been given um so yeah, so again, I think that this is a really, you know, a really difficult thing uh, to, to sort of understand. It is a complex problem to solve, but I think you at least need to, you need to answer the question and understand what emotion, what feeling, what sense, what series of accomplishments, what are we trying to do, right, with this game? Um, and I think that that is, uh, I think that's an important one. <laughs> I think that's an important one to cover for sure. All right, uh, let's see. Well, lesson number four Oops. is to make use of- I already went that one. All right. Up on the wall. Lesson number seven. So this one happened on a plane ride to Gen Con. So that's a big gaming convention. Um, I was seated next to Christopher Rush. R.I.P. Uh, sadly just passed away a few uh, weeks ago. Um, he is a magic illustrator, probably best known for illustrating Black Lotus, one of the most iconic magic cards. Um, also, not a lot of people realize this, but he also did all the mana symbols. By the way, this is an example of where Pathfinder 2nd Edition crushes it and just gets it 100% right. So his, his work sticks with us today. So he and I were talking about land. So in, in the game of magic, land's the basic resource. It, it's a pretty boring part of the game in the big picture. It's not where the excitement lies. Um, and Chris came up with a neat idea. He said, what if we took the land, which looked like this at the time, and we made the art real big, and we did something exciting where the art was most of the card. And the rest of the people there said, uh, Chris, no. That, that's not what a land looks like, and who cares? We don't need it. The land's not the exciting part of the game. We don't need to worry about the land. So a year later, uh, I made a set called Unglued, which was a very different kind of set. And so I put full art land in. I said, I thought it was a neat idea. And beloved, players really liked it. So a number of years later, I did it again. I made the art bigger. These are my, these ones, these un, these uh, unhinged lands are my favorite lands. I have a complete set of those. Those are my, these these ones, the second ones with the complete full art. These are my favorite lands of all time. Um, eventually we started putting it in normal sets. And Zendikar had full art land, very popular. Battle for Zendikar had them, very popular. And what we found was players really did attach to the land. It mattered to them. And it wasn't just a matter of full art that we started working on trying really hard to make sure that all our lands had a very unique look to them so that we gave the player choices. That when you play an island, for example, obviously there's five basic lands in an island, that you had a lot of choices. We even experimented. There's some cards we made, which these are real actual earth places that were on cards. And here's one, for example, the, the Guru Island that was made by Therese Nielsen. Very pretty. It's very rare. It's one of the most valued cards in the game because players do care. It's not, it's not just an island. It's not just a basic land. That players care about that. So that leads us into lesson number seven. Allow the player the ability to make the game personal. Mm -hmm. Back to college. This time, an advertising class. So I learned something really interesting. So if you're in a store staring at a shelf and you've never purchased the product before, what are you most likely to purchase? The brand you're most familiar with. Why? Why is that? Because it's a little quirk in the brain. So it associates your knowledge of something with quality. Because if you know it, well, then it must mean it's better. That knowledge equals quality. 
Okay, for the psychologists out there, technically knowledge equals familiarity, which equals preference, which equals quality, but I'm shortcutting here by, by the transitive property works. Um, so the idea essentially is your brain just, it prioritizes things you know, that things in your brain, it just thinks that they're better because you know them. So what this means in game design, it's, in, it's important for your players to have a personal connection with your game. The more the players feel the game is about them, the better their brain will think of it. So how do you do that? Okay, provide a lot of choice. I told you this is the one that Pathfinder 2 knocks out of the park. <laughs> Give them different resources, different paths, different expressions. Give the player the ability to choose, and importantly, not to choose things. Allowing them to feel that what they choose is theirs. So for example, in Magic, one of the things I think that really helps Magic is we give you so much choice. You can choose your colors, you can choose your creatures, you can choose your characters, you can choose your factions, you can choose your illustrations, and of course, you can choose your frames, that there's so many options available to you. So lesson number seven is allow the player the ability to make the game personal. So just remember, the players will think more highly of things that they can find a personal connection to. And in order for you to do that, make sure you give them the choices to be able to find the things to be to make personal. So, yeah, so, I mean, obviously this is a, in, 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 I think, I think we can all understand that this is definitely something that uh, Pathfinder 2, I think, definitely is going out of its way to, uh, you know, <laughs> to, to sort of make important. Um, and, you know, some of the complaints that have occurred uh, about other versions of the game uh, have been that, you know, like, fifth edition where people say there's not enough choices there's not enough things and this obviously is something that not only does the current game take seriously but they also clearly understand that this is one of the niches that they are really trying to explore this is why we see so many ancestries and heritages and classes and archetypes because these are all and and 300 plus weapons why does the game have 300 plus weapons it's so that you can allow the players the ability to make the game more personal. Now, I will fully agree with Mark Rosewater that this is a good thing. And look at all the people in Pathfinder 2 who absolutely love all the variety. You hear, you see it all over the, the, the internet, right? How different their character is, how unique their character is, how special their character is. I chose this weapon. I will show people games like 13th Age where it basically says, hey, you know what, you're a fighter, you do D12 damage or D10 damage because, you know, you, you do big damage. It doesn't matter what you use. It's just kind of flavor and fluff. It just does whatever. And people hate that rule, okay? People hate that rule. They're like, no, I want to be able to pick my weapon and I want to be able to use my weapon and I want that choice to matter. Um, now, just because... Mark's right, because by the way, this is definitely something that helps the game succeed in the sense that it brings in a lot of people and it keeps them there. Now, for me personally, that's just not a, you know, that's not a big, uh, that's not interesting, right? And it's not particularly uh, uh, compelling, but I'm also not everybody. And I definitely think that he is correct, that by and large, one of the reasons that I see people get so into Pathfinder is because they feel like they are able to customize these characters to such an intricate degree. I mean, you know, without a certain amount of, uh, uh, of qualifications, it's probably safe to say that every character in Pathfinder 2nd Edition is more or less unique. The exact combination of feats and ancestry and class and skill feats and skill training, I mean, it's it's probably a safe bet to say that it's unique. And, and that, I think, gives people that you know, sense of ownership. And I think that's what people really, really buy into. Now, you'll note though, that Mark Rosewater talked about this in the thing. You know, he said, it's not just about the game choices, right? It's also about the choices they make, the different paths they take. So this is where I'm going to get a little bit critical. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to this really quick. Uh, here we go. So how do you do that? Okay. Provide a lot of choices. Great. We did that. Give them different resources. Okay, we're we do we do that sometimes, but not all the time. And it's not always clear that that is the intention of the game. In fact, sometimes it feels like they are they don't want you to have resources. Different paths. Ooh, now we're getting into a real problem, right? Because now I think you know where this idea of making the adventure your own comes in is not just what you built on your character, right? But you know what is going on in the game uh ryan from our uh from our discord and i were discussing the other day uh b2 keep on the borderlands right famous adventure caves of chaos and there's an ogre the legendary ogre and he and i were giving our descriptions uh, i was telling my story about what happened i remember the first time my i ran that adventure and my group of 
PCs encountered the ogre. I rolled on the reaction chart and I got like 11 or 12. He was friendly and he wanted their help. He, he had been at war with the goblin tribe and he said, look, you know, we'll be enemies tomorrow, but today the enemy of my enemy is right friend. Let's team up together and we'll take out the goblins. And they did. And like the, the ogre was there, you know, was running point with them and crushing goblins. And Ryan described something entirely different that they were completely afraid of it. They thought it was a bear cause it was sleeping and they came over and poked it. And then it started attacking them and killing them. And then they ended up joining up with the goblins to try to kill it again, wildly different choices. But the, but the thing is that made the game personal. That made the game personal for us because we understood that what we were doing in that moment was unique and the choices we were making were shaping the outcome. And this is something I think that modern RPGs, Pathfinder 2, 5th edition, get, you know, people get lost in this and people become really, really, really obsessed with, you got to stay on the adventure path, right? You got to stay on the railroad. I, that's great. I think that is, that's fantastic, but it doesn't let you make the game personal. And that I think is where the mistake is. It doesn't let the game become personal. And I think that that is what's really important. Um, all right, lesson eight. Um, the details are where the players fall in love. Now, Mark uh, talks about this a little bit where he just talks about like a unique, weird c creature that the, uh, you know, the, the, the audience really fell in love with, Fibble Thip. Um, but the idea is that, uh, you know, every care, every person who plays the game is going to kind of come to it as sort of a, of, of a unique experience and, you need to provide, you know, people say details aren't important. The details are absolutely important. And this is the kind of, you know, like it's very rare in my experience, you know, except for maybe with people like me where, <laughs> uh, where people fall in love with concepts and, and systems and, you know, sort of these, uh, these sort of vague notions, uh, of a game's concept, like, oh, I love blades in the dark. Why clocks? Right. That is that is a very like intellectual, you know, nerdy, like philosophical way of approaching Blades in the Dark. I love Blades in the Dark because of clocks. I love Blades in the Dark because I love the action action agency of reaction roles. Like, no, like most people fall in love because they love this one feat or this one magical item, or they think Duskwall is such a cool city and such a cool concept, or they love the idea of the ghost field, right? Um, people fall in love with the details of a game. I mean, for, for no other reason, look at how many people, even in Knights of Last Call Discord, who are just in love with Galarian and they love that world. And, you know, they, 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 they to them, Galarian and Pathfinder are almost synonymous because it's the details of the game where they, you know, really, really, you know, care about the game a lot. Um, all right. Lesson nine, which is kind of a con continuation of, of lesson, le uh, lesson uh, seven, allow your players to have a sense of ownership. Now you all know me here. I am a strong believer that the more your players feel empowered and feel like they are not just a passive participant in your game, but an active participant in your game who are shaping and molding and changing the game. Now in his speech, Mark Rosewater gives an example of the commander format, which is now the most popular format in magic by far. And he wrote the, this, this art, this uh, video is from six years ago. It's even bigger now. Wizards of the Coast didn't create commander. That was nothing that they did. That was a, player generated thing that caught on and created all the rules for it. You know, they, that was generated. Part of the reason people love commander is because it's their format. The rules of commander are sort of, you know, it varies from table to table because it's not an official format. So in my experience where this translates into role-playing games, this is why I love things like collaborative world building. This is why I love things like, uh, meta currencies that allow the players to shape and control the narrative because I want my players to not just feel like they are a passive participant in the game around them. Or at the very least, if you aren't going to use any meta currencies, you aren't going to use any collaboration or world building at the very least, the players should feel like that the actions that they are taking in the game matter. If they kill an NPC 
And regardless of whether they kill him or don't kill him, he gets away because it needs to happen for the story. You are taking from them the sense that they are the owners of this game, that they are, that they are the ones who are uh, in the driver's seat. And so for me, I, I, you know, this is about player agency, but for me, it's even a bigger, you know, uh, expanse to that. I want my players to feel like they are part owners of this game. I don't want them to feel like they're just here, you know, renting for a room for a night. I want them to feel like they are part owners, right. Of this, uh, of this, uh, hotel and establishment. And I want them to be shaping things and making things. people uh, I've, I've done this at, for years at cons, especially when I play, uh, you know, even, even when I play D 20 games, I'll do this. Um, you know, somebody will make a check, uh, you know, like, what is that thing? And, you know, I'll say, I don't know, make a craft check and they'll, you know, roll really high. And I'll say, I don't know. What is that thing? You tell me. And they'll be like, really? And I'll be like, yeah. And they're like, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, the thing that the, the, this, I said, oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. You, that you're the expert. You rolled really high. Of course that's what it is. And, and they're like, there's always this weird sort of like moment where they're like, did that just happen? Did I really just like make the game world my own. And a lot of times I, I think it's a very empowering moment for a lot of players. Um, and I think that that is something that, uh, that is important to sort of keep in mind. Um, all right, let's move on here. All right. That's lesson nine. All right. Now this is one where uh, we're going to start appealing to some of my, some of my my regulars in the chat who I know are um we'll we'll just call them what they are they're power gamers right uh they 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 like to play the game to win right and um let's talk more. about it okay lesson number 10 so we made a card a while back called summoner's pact so here's what summoner's pact does it lets you go into your library with your deck and get a green creature out of it and put it in play um the trick is it doesn't cost anything well next turn you have to pay for it you have to be putting on credit um so you you don't have to pay for it now you have to pay for it next turn Right, so Summoner's Pack is free. You cast it. You get go get any creature you want out of your deck, and you know you can cast it. So you can go get your best creature and cast it, and it's free. The only problem is, on your next turn, you have to pay a fairly high price for it, and if you don't, you immediately lose the game. Now, if you don't, you lose the game, but probably you won't cast this if you can't do that. So that's okay. Right. So that in of itself, fine mechanic, right? So this card lets you get a free green creature out of your deck. I mean, free for the turn, but good enough. Maybe you'll win this turn. Um, okay, now we have a card called Hivemind we made. So what Hivemind does is it says, whenever a certain kind of spell is played, you can copy it. So the idea is, let's say someone casts Divination, that's lets you draw cards. Everybody gets a Divination, everybody gets to draw cards. Okay, so what happens when Hivemind meets Summoner's Pact? Hey, everybody gets a Summoner's Pact. But here's the problem. Everybody gets to get a green creature out of their deck. A lot of them don't even have a green creature in their deck, and this is on payment. They gotta pay this next turn, or they lose the game. So you see where this is going. So we started with a card that gets a green creature out of your deck, and another card, that copy certain spells, but when you add them together, you win the game. Now, win the game. That's not something we built into that. When we made each of these cards, that was nothing we had in mind. This is something that the players came up with. So this is lesson number 10. Leave room for your players to explore. Right? Uh, this is such an important lesson. This is just such an important lesson because I, I, I'm not trying to say that like broken and degenerate things should, you know, be what we're aiming for in game design, right? Far from it. But I think finding these interesting combinations of powers and abilities is a, such a fun part of, of games, right? And even like when I play a board game, not necessarily like, oh, it's an infinite combo or my all the people win or pre, all the people lose and I win. But there are board games where I go, oh, wow, I've never noticed it before. If I take this card and I take this card and I use them at the same time, I create a really, really cool mechanic that'll give me a really, really big advantage. I like that feeling of like exploring the game and finding these interesting, you know, not just interesting, but powerful and fun, like nuggets within the game. Okay, so I said, you wanna give them choices. You need to give them details. You need to give them customization. Okay, so let's talk about how they're presented. Okay, well, before I was a game designer, I worked in Hollywood. I was a TV writer, if you didn't know. In TV, there's something called the pitch. So the idea of a pitch is you stand up in front of the room and you have to sell people on your story. And this is very crucial. The difference between being a good writer and a bad writer is your ability to pitch. So I took a lot of classes in it. So the number one rule is don't talk at, at your audience. You want to talk with them. So here's one of the tricks they taught you. So when you're doing your pitch, you want to get your audience to ask questions. 
Why is that so important? Because people are more invested in things that they initiated. That if you just talk, they might drone you out. But if you get them to ask you a question, then they tune in because you're asking, you're answering their question. So this is very important when it comes to game design. Don't always show the players the things you want them to see. Let your players find them. Give them the choices to design a customization, but let it be things they discover. Because if they find it, they'll be more invested. So lesson number 10, leave room for the player to explore. This is also, by the way, like, you know, I, I've, I've seen people who like play video games and like it's they're literally playing the video game for the first time. And they've got, you know, their Xbox controller or their PlayStation controller. And then next to them is the laptop that is open to the strategy guide of the game. This to me, it, it does not make any sense to me at all about why people do this. Um, like, I think exploring game spaces is such an important part of the fun of them. And I think being able to find interesting and powerful and cool and unique combinations of abilities is part of the reason we play games. Um, and so, you know, when I think about, you know, some of these games today that have been, you know, they, they've already figured it all out, you know, like it, it, all of the important stuff has been decided. Um, it can, it can leave me feeling a little, you know, empty inside. Um, you know, I remember this is a long time ago. This is, this is a really long time ago. There used to be an advanced Dungeons and Dragons comic book. Okay. An advanced Dungeons and Dragons comic book. And in this advanced Dungeons and Dragons comic book, the, in the first, uh, in the first series, there was a, the, the villain. And he was like a, like a, dr like a draconic, humanoid spellcaster. And I remember that one of his, uh, he was like a sorcerer. And I remember that uh, this stuck with me forever. I mean, I was pretty young. I was probably like 11 or 12 when I read this. And I remember that one of his underlings, you know, came to report to him. Oh, oh, sorry, my Lord, the, the, the heroes got away, you know? And I remember that he, you know, said some cold ass shit to him and then he cast and i remember in the comic book whenever anyone would cast a spell like the speech bubble would have like purple and blue like energy around it it looked really cool and he went he was like flesh to stone and you know petrified the underling and then in the next panel you see him walking away and with his other hand he goes cast rock to mud which was a, a spell in second edition and the statue just you know dissipated into a, a pool of mud and I thought it was like the coldest, most badass thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was like, I was like, oh my God, flesh to stone plus rock to mud. Like you petrify them and then you turn them into a pile of mud. They're not coming back from that. That's crazy. And I just remember being so, I mean, that made me fall in love with D&D &D in a weird way because I was just like, wow, I could combine these spells in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of crazy combinations. Some of the game design, the modern game design, I think has taken away some of that, uh, you know, some of that interestingness of it, some of the fun of that um, in the name of creating a more balanced game. Uh, and I don't necessarily know that that is great. I like being able to explore and being able to explore means there's difference, right? If you explore and everything is the same around you, you're not really exploring, right? Uh, Exploration requires there to be terrain. There has to be dips and peaks, right? There needs to be changes in elevation and terrain. So we have to be able to see stuff like that. Hey, it's 820 and we're through 10. So we might finish tonight if uh, we, if we stay on track. So here we go. Um, and again, I, I'm sorry if I'm ignoring some of the chat because, uh, you know, I am trying to get this uh, finished uh, in time. All right. This is very, very important. The idea of investment is a key part of what makes people bond. And so you want to make sure that you're not always giving it to them. Just like when I was doing my pitch, I didn't want to just give them the story. I wanted to get them to ask me the story because then they were invested in me telling it. By the way, on the wall. <laughs> how, does, number 11. how does that, so do how does that uh, differ, differentiate from the way that most GMs, you know, play and run adventure paths, right? You're not always giving it to them. Just like when I was doing my pitch, I didn't want to just give them the story. I wanted to get them to ask me the story because then they were invested in me telling it which is to imply that if, if your players aren't asking you questions, they're not involved in your story, actually. Up on the wall. Okay, lesson number 11. So in R&D, we do something called a rare poll. So we want to understand what impact our rares and mythic rares are going to have on our audience. So what do we do? We ask magic players who work at Wizards, but not in R&D, to take a poll and give us their feedback. So each card's graded on a scale from 1 to 10. 1 means something you, would be, you don't want to play with. 10, you'd be very excited to open it up. 
Okay, then we collect all the data and we use it to figure out which cards we should keep and which cards we should change. This this t- sounds like something totally that we would all do, right? Uh, you know, especially with nights of last call. Okay, so which is better? A card which receives all sevens or a card with half ones and twos and half nines and tens? Now, I think you all know what the answer is, but I also think a lot of you are probably nodding your head right now because you know what I'm going to say uh, is wrong, with you know, which is that modern game design, in my opinion, kind of does the opposite. I'll give you a second. Which one do you think is better? The second. A card with half ones and twos and half nines and tens. Why? Because we prefer cards that evoke a strong response, even if some of that response is negative. So it brings us to lesson number 11. If everyone likes your game, but no one loves it, it will fail. So my metaphor here is a blind date. So when you go on a blind date, you have a list of things you want, the things you're looking for. And at the end of the blind date, if everything is checked off on your list, but there was no joy in the date, there was no excitement, there was no passion, it doesn't matter that you checked off your list. There won't be a second date. You know, the, the blind date isn't about not having negative things, it's about having something positive. So players don't need to love everything, but they need to love something. Something has to draw them into your game, something they feel strongly about. Now, don't worry that players will hate something. Worry that no one will love anything. Because things that evoke strong responses will most often evoke strong responses in many directions, meaning that it's almost impossible to make players love something without making other players hate it. In fact, some players enjoy hating what other players love. Stop, Mark. So it's almost impossible. So stop worrying about evoking a negative response and start worrying about evoking a strong response. So lesson number 11, if everyone likes your game but no one loves it, it will fail. And I can't stress this enough. People too often want to minimize the negative. They're so worried about not having anybody dislike something that they miss the big picture, which is that's not the important part. You have to make sure you evoke the positive response. People have to fall in love. There's a lot of attention out there. There's a lot of games to play. If your game doesn't make someone fall in love with it, guess what? They're going to go to a game that does. So uh, lesson number 11, uh, obviously, Mark, you know, a lot of times we talk about experiences. And I've said this before on previous streams, on whiteboard streams, right, where I talk about ceilings and floors of experiences, right, of where someone comes into a game and the game could be amazing, incredible. And the person would say that's a 10 out of 10 game. But sometimes the game goes off the rails. Sometimes the game is uh, is a crazy train wreck and it maybe wasn't that great. Maybe it wasn't that fun. Everyone died and uh, everybody lost all their gear and you're playing first edition AD&D and uh, uh, an undead appeared and drained away all your levels permanently, right? That would obviously be like a one or a two. But I think having that wide range of experiences, I think makes for a more compelling game. However, modern game design, I think, will do anything to eliminate ones and twos and threes because ones and twos and threes that's what makes people quit games that's what makes people never pick up a game in fact think about it this way the average of a bunch of nines and tens and a bunch of ones and twos is five and you know mark rosewater was saying if you could have that or you could have all sevens which is a higher average right from an expected value proposition, you should always want to take the seven, right? And the truth of the matter with Mark is saying is, no, you don't. Because having a consistently homogenized C level experience, you know, C, C, C plus experience is not going to make anybody get passionate and hyped up and fall in love with your game, right? Having highs and lows, having things you love, and things you hate, getting emotional, getting invested, that is what's going to make your game stick in people's minds. Now, of course, there is a very real chance that someone comes and plays your game, they have a terrible experience, a one out of two, a one or a two out of 10 experience, and they quit your game and they never play again. And in my personal experience, I think that is what fifth edition is deliberately and exactly designed to avoid. I think Pathfinder second edition is as well because they do not want people to ever have any sort of experience that is negative with their game, right? And so, and in fact, I would go out of their way to say that I think that they actively design and try to avoid it. Um, And now obviously they design different things for different people, which is a great thing. But I think on an overall statement, if 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 you try to please everybody, you're not gonna win, you know? And maybe you win just because of market factors and the fact that everybody plays D and D and everybody plays Pathfinder. But I, I think that a lot of people, you know, um, don't have the same kind of, you know, we, we've talked about this on this channel before. 
where sometimes we feel like, oh, man, a lot of these people, like we said, a lot of these people have joined the hobby in the last five to 10 years. I wonder if they're going to be playing it, you know, when they're 30 or 40 or 50, like so many of us are. And I could tell you that it's because when I was a kid and I was playing the game for the first time, I had these visceral life altering moments happen at the game table. Like it, it, it almost to a weird way where it felt real. Like me and my friends actually went through some crazy, you know, shit. Like we, I don't know, like, like, you know, like some movie adventure, but it was actually just us sitting around my, you know, parents' kitchen table. I, I wonder if these modern games deliver that same kind of experience. And if so, is that maybe why it feels like people aren't as invested um, as they used to be? And I don't know, you know, I don't know the exact answer to this, but I think it is uh, kind of an interesting thought, you know? Um, let's see here. Um, and again, I apologize if I missed, you know, your, your, your chats here, but, um, how does this lesson mess with 5e? Feels like the definition of aiming for sevens. Absolutely. 5e. It, it, what 5e wants to do is they want to create a game that pisses off nobody at no, at for not that every option you go, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. That is what they are aiming for a hundred percent. And I think PF, I think Ayla's right. I think Pathfinder 2 um, is in many cases is the same way. All right. Up on the board. Lesson number 12. Okay, so in the game, we have planeswalkers. These are characters that cast magic, that duel with magic. You, the player, you're a planeswalker. And we spend a lot of time and energy on these planeswalkers. They're our major characters in the story. In fact, we make cards out of them. And the planeswalker cards are very popular. In fact, they're some of the most popular cards we make. Whenever we have a new set, people always ask about the new cards. So this story goes back to Abyssin Restored in May of 2012. We made a card called Tybalt. So he was a devil planeswalker. They used like pain magic and a sharp dresser. Um, but we decided that he was only going to cost two mana. Because we had cards. We had four mana, three mana, six mana, five mana. We, we'd done all that. We'd never done a two mana planeswalker. Now, nothing about this being two mana serves the card or the character. We just wanted to see if we could do it. So what happened? <laughs> Tybalt sucked. <laughs> One of the reasons people love planeswalkers is they're powerful. They're good. We tend to make our planeswalkers good. But by making it two mana, we didn't allow ourselves the ability to do that. And the reason they didn't like him was he just was weak because he cost two mana. So this brings us to lesson number 12. Don't design to prove you can do something. So I'm going to let you know on a secret. People who create tend to have large egos because it takes ego to will something into existence. Now, having an ego is fine. I personally have a very large ego. Um, but you can't let your ego drive your motivation. Remember, your goal is to deliver an optimal experience for your target audience. Your decisions have to serve your game and not you. So ask yourself, is this decision helping me achieve the optimal experience for my target audience? Or is it being done to fulfill an inwardly facing need for self-satisfaction? Because <laughs> if the answer is the latter, you're doing it for the wrong reason. So number 12, don't design to prove you can do something. And one of the things, I think people fall in the trap. We are game designers, and most of us, or all of us pretty much, are game players. And it's really easy to fall in the trap to think of game design as a game that you're trying to have fun playing. But the problem is, it's not about enjoying the experience. It's not about testing yourself. It's about making the best game possible. I, I, this is one of the reasons why, honestly, this is one of the reasons why I'm so critical of, uh, of a lot of people who are talking about game design. It's one of the reasons why I'm critical of myself for game design. It's one of the reasons why I'm hesitant to call myself even anything close to a game designer. It's why I'm hesitant to even do game design. It's exactly because what Mark is talking about right here. And most of us, or all of us pretty much, are game players. And it's really easy to fall in the trap to think of game design as a game that you're trying to have fun playing. But the problem is, it's not about enjoying the experience. It's not about testing yourself. It's about making the best game possible. So don't fall in the trap of sort of entertaining yourself for the sake of making your game the best the game can be. So, yeah. So, um, you know, I think that this is, uh, this is an important lesson because, um, you know, Tybalt, you know, people, people want planeswalkers to be awesome and cool. And they were like, oh, we can make a, we can make a really cheap one and it'll be, you know, effective. It's like, no, it's like, don't put something in the game just because you think it's, you know, this sort of really cool, interesting moment, you know, this really kind of intellectual puzzle. It's this interesting thing that you think is really cool. It's like, no. Don't design something just to prove you can do something. You need to put something in your game because it's going to be interesting and fun and engaging with, you know, the game. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say this, that like, I think there's a lot of mechanics <clears throat> in Pathfinder 2 uh, that kind of fall into this space a little bit because like you have this action economy system and they were like, look, we need to come up with ways to use the action economy system. That's our big thing. Three actions, we wanna make sure that people are using it. And so a lot of abilities and powers and spells and feats all were like, oh, we need to use the action economy system because that's what action economy, that's what we put them in here for. And so you end up with a lot of these cool things and then they go, well, that 
that's clearly more powerful. We have this action economy system, so we need to make this cost two actions or three actions, and it becomes uh, a pain in the butt. And, it, and it's no longer fun or cool because you're just trying to prove that like, oh, it's this intellectual challenge between should you use power tech, should you not use power tech? It's two actions instead of one action. It's like there's a lot of uh, problems that come up. You know, the, the ranger and their hunt prey ability is something similar. Well, the, the ranger can't just get all these things. That's the fighter's thing. We have to make them, right? We're, we're bound to this idea that we have about the game without really thinking about but is this going to be an enjoyable experience? And is this going to create a sort of a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a point for, for, for us, you know, for other, for other players. So yeah, don't design something just to prove that you can design something. On the wall. Lesson number 13. Let's we go back 13. to 2004. That called unhinged. So this was a humorous set, which broke a lot of rules that we never normally break because magic is often very competitive. And the product wanted to remind people the game can be fun. Magic can be fun. So we put a silver border on it to say, you can't even play these in tournaments. It's non-tournament legal. Okay. So in it, we had a mechanic called gotcha. So here's how gotcha works. If this card was in your graveyard, if your opponent did a certain thing, this card particularly, if they said the word kill or destroy, which happened to be the name of the card, you could say gotcha, and you could get it back from your graveyard. And there are all sorts of gotcha effects. If they said a number, if they touched the table, if they flipped their cards, if they touched their face, if they laugh, if they laugh, you could say gotcha and get it back. So what, what was the best way to win this game? Well, <laughs> don't talk, because you might say something. You know, don't interact, because you might do something. Don't do anything fun. You know, heaven forbid you laugh. Uh, so leave us a lesson number 13. Make the fun part also the correct strategy to win. Now, here is something I think we can all agree that uh, sometimes, you know, the games, they, this, they, they fail to deliver on this, right? Which is making the fun part also the correct strategy uh, to win, right? You want the thing that people want to do to actually be the correct strategy, right? There are so many instances in role-playing games where what you want to do, what feels like it should be the fun thing to do, which feels like it should be the great thing to do is actually a horrible idea. And what ends up happening is somebody, you know, later explains to you, oh, actually the better idea is for you to just, you know, um, you know, do this really boring, ineffective turn, you know? And, and as an example, without qualification for the most part, if you're a cleric in Pathfinder 2nd Edition um, and you're fighting a harder fight, severe fight, or certainly a creature, you know, plus PL plus two, PL plus three monster. The best thing for you to do is to cast heal every single turn. Hands down, it is going to by far give you the best chance of winning with no casualties. I just question whether that is fun, right? And Pumpkin is coming into the chat and saying PF2 has heal and tyranny of strike, as, uh, as Strat likes to call it, right? There's a lot of instances where you play Pathfinder 2nd Edition and you have all these feats and all these cool things, right? And and what's the best option? To strike. It, that is your best option, like 95% of the time. It's to strike. It's just to strike. It's just to swing with your sword and do damage. And that is, I feel like, a miss, right? Like, the, 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 the things that your players are getting like excited about and the fun thing is the thing that should be the right thing to do. You know, um, you know, think about how many hoops you have to jump through to get off certain feats. You know, whirlwind attack from Barbarian, I think is really cool. But of course, kind of going back to number 12 and number 13, it, it isn't really actually all that effective because it takes three actions. And unless you're making you know, two or three or four attacks with it, it then you, you probably need haste at least minimum to even be able to use it effectively, right? There's, there's so many things about that feat that make it so that it's not really an ideal action. It's not really an ideal strategy, but man, that's the fun thing. That's what I want to do. I mean, think about it this way. If I was a barbarian and there was a bunch of my, and the combat starting and I'm a barbarian, what, what do I want to do? I want to rage. I want to run into the middle of those enemies and I want to swing around in a big circle and hit them all. But those of you who know Pathfinder 2 know that I just described an impossible sequence of events, right? Because even if I was hasted, I can't rage and stride and do a whirlwind attack, right? And so that isn't, that is just to me a failure. Um, you know, uh, a cephalodog says, this is also a problem in modern fighting games. Best option for every character in Street Fighter 6 is to drive, rush, jab, or shoot a fireball 90% of the time. I don't know much about fighting games, but 
like I used to play Soul Calibur, and I remember that the uh, Ivy was the character with the cool sword that could break apart. She had all these crazy moves, all these incredible things that she could do with her whip sword. But the fact of the matter is, like most of them were garbage, and it was just better just kind of like do her like elbow smash, elbow smash, elbow smash. No, I want to stab people with my cool long sword. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but big scary monster. You know that's exactly right. What do you mean? Don't fight this thing. What are you talking about? I'm the Hulk. It's a big, scary monster. I want to go attack, right? That is, that is the best part. Um, also the problem with spellcaster Pathfinder too, the good spells are boring. Absolutely. Of course, I completely agree with you. Um, so again, I think there is something to be said here about, you know, you need to have variety and you need to have uh, a variety of actions. Not every action always has to be like, absolutely fun but it is definitely the case that you know um <laughs> that that you should make the fun thing the strategy to kc i think hit it out of the park here um as he usually does can i pull the lever and drop the chandelier on the enemies grouped up in the middle sure it deals minimal damage and we'll make sure you'll never want to do anything cool ever again. I was recently kind of complaining about this um, on a recent stream about fourth edition. Uh, I was pointing out page 42, which is a great page in the DMG that gives you this improvised damage table expression. It's great. The problem is when you read the improvised damage expression table, you realize that the damage is not competitive with your character's base powers because of course that isn't because they want your characters to, you know, you know, uh, be, you know, not feeling like their powers are being uh, overtaken by somebody dropping a chandelier on people. But that's fun and interesting and cool and, you know, and and unique and niche. And it's not going to ever come. How often are you going to have a group of enemies underneath a chandelier? If that's happening a lot in your campaign, we have something to talk about. Like when that happens, yeah, make that, make that the best strategy and let the players feel like that is amazing. Like that is awesome. And I think you're going to see better results, you know, time and time and time again. And I mean, this is just the flat out truth, which is, uh, you know, when people talk about the good spells of Pathfinder 2, the ones that we, you know, routinely rate A's and S's, it's like heroism, give your bonus to, you know, uh, aid, give a bonus than this, uh, you know, um, haste to give you more action. It's just like more actions, higher bonus, equal better. And that's the end of the game. I mean, that's, that's that. And then, and you're going to use those actions to strike. And that's going to be like majority of what you're doing. Um, <laughs> big number go burr, more like big number go snore. So yeah, um, so yeah, definitely agree with a lot of what's being said here. All right, Mark. It's not the player's job to find the fun. It is your job as a game designer to put the fun where they can't help but find it. Because when players sit down to a game, there's an implied promise from the game designer. The game designer says, if you do what the game tells you to do, it will be an enjoyable experience. So the players will do whatever the game tells them to achieve the desired goals, usually to win. Even if that isn't fun, they'll do it. By the way, that that is hard to read, but it says, uh, it says, uh, they'll do it to win. I have to bang my head on the table until I pass out. <laughs> and when the game is done, if the players didn't have fun, <laughs> that's awesome. they will blame the game, and rightfully so, because you, the designer, have messed up. You have not delivered on the promise. They did what you asked. You didn't do. You didn't fulfill your end of the bargain. So remember, you have to make sure that what it takes to succeed at your game is the very thing that makes it fun. Fun cannot be tangential. It has to be the core component of your game experience. So le lesson number 13, make the fun part also the correct strategy to win. Now, this is a, this is a big, you know, this is a, this is, he's talking to me here, you know, because I often say, you know, your, your, your goal as a game master shouldn't be to make, you know, the game fun, your, your game. And, and effectively, what I was saying is your job is to make the game interesting and the players will find their own fun. And you know what? Mark is coming at me and saying, Derek, you're wrong. You are wrong. And you, you need to be thinking about, the, the engagement at the table. And this is something that I have been going through over the last couple of months as I look back at some of my other, uh, uh, you know, past campaigns and recent campaigns. And I think about the times when, what was my priority in the game? Was it making it fun or was it making it interesting? And I'm like, man, when I was prioritizing making it fun, it really was coming out with a better game. It was absolutely no longer as intellectually uh, as a puzzle or something to be solved. But I think people came at the end of the day, when you look back at it, people had a better experience. And I think that's, I think that's something that's important to consider, right? I don't think that that means that everything should just be fun and dumb 
and not have anything interesting into it. But I do think that, you know, Mark, uh, Mark's right. You know, we, we, we can't ignore the fact that these, you know, if we make the ideal strategy, very interesting, but very boring, then that we, we have failed. And I see this mistake be made all the time where like they find something fun and then add other things around it. And the people like I, I, we do this thing where we watch a little window and you, you see how your audience is playing the game. And sometimes they go the wrong path and they don't do what you expect them to do. Well, guess what? If they find unfun parts of the game, you put them there. You know, make sure that the fun part is you guide them there and they find it because that is what's gonna make them love the game is the fun part. Well, make sure they find the fun part. Uh, DJ Hyperduck Band, is this rule calling out you, the game master or the designer of the TTRPG uh, you are playing? Um, ooh, that's a great question. Uh, DJ Hyper Duckman. Um, I think as a game master, I think I have a little bit of, uh, of uh, as the game master, I think you have a little bit of responsibility of here. But yeah, maybe maybe there's a certain element there too where you say, yeah, like what the players were just playing to the game as it was designed. And you know what? And the net, you know, look, that's why I paid money, right? That's why I didn't design my own game. I paid somebody else to design my game. Um and, you know, they, like like Mark Rosewater was saying, there's an impli implicit promise there that, yes, this game is going to deliver a fun experience if you just do what I tell you to do. So, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Although, again, I think, uh, you know, GMs do bear, uh, you know, they, they, they are the ones who are sort of setting the course. But, yeah, I think that uh, that's a good point. So, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. All right. Make the fun strategy or also the correct strategy to win. All right. Continuing, Mark. Up in the walls. Lesson number 14. So this is Rise of Eldrazi back in 2010. So it obviously had the Eldrazi in it. These guys were giant and alien and hungry. They were eating the world. So at Common, we made a card called Ulamog's Crusher. So he was giant. He was 8-8, which for a Common is pretty big. Yep. He was uh, alien. Look at him. He looks really weird. Also, yep. most magic cards are colored. He was colorless. Um, and he was hungry. He had an ability called Annihilator. And Annihilator had a number. And every time you attacked, your, your opponent had to sacrifice that many things. So Annihilator 2 means every time you attacked, they had to sacrifice two things. So what would happen is we would play this, and we did some play testing, and the players wouldn't attack with him. I'm like, what, what's going on? And what we learned was they were afraid. Here's this awesome creature. They finally got it out. They didn't want something bad to happen to the creature, so they weren't attacking with it. But we knew that attacking with it was really good. How could we educate them? How could we get them to realize they needed to attack with it? Well, the solution was force them to attack with it. <laughs> so we just said, okay, you have to attack. We put this on the, one of the common cards, and when they attacked, they realized it was good, and they did it more. And so the key was by forcing their hand, we, we educated them. So lesson number 14, don't be afraid to be blunt. Artists tend to prefer subtlety. They're taught, show, don't tell. But sometimes subtlety doesn't work. People can just miss the obvious. For example, in Magic, we use keywords to make sure that players can focus on mechanics. But once upon a time, back in Mercadian Math, back in 1999, we had mechanics, but we didn't name them. We, we didn't have keywords. And the number one question we got was, why doesn't this set have mechanics? So sometimes to get your audience to understand, you have to be willing to embrace, to embrace bluntness. I like to think of my creative tools as a toolbox. And sometimes you just need a hammer. So lesson number 14, don't be afraid to be blunt. We as artists are taught subtlety, 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 subtlety. And a lot of the times you want to be subtle, but that doesn't mean that you can't use bluntness when it's valuable and when it'll get across what you need to. Um, and so again, th this is a great lesson just also as a GM. Like I've said this before, you know, you could you could basically flat out tell your players in the description, like, uh, and, and by the way, this is this guy is the murderer and they will still miss it, right? Um, don't be afraid to be very obvious and and to point out what, you know, what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. And like, again, this is one of the reasons why I liked fourth edition's role so much because yes, it was very, I was very obtuse. It was like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Go do this thing. If you do this thing, you'll get rewarded. And it's, you know, it's very, very, very great. If you don't do this, you're doing something wrong because a lot of times I think people look at monsters, they even look at character classes and they go, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I, I, I'm very, un it's very unclear to me. Um, how this game is supposed to operate, um, uh, how this class is supposed to operate. And, you know, certainly there's an element there of exploring, which I think is fine because I don't think the game, you know, I don't think the game should take away too much choice. If you, if you're, if you're too blunt, the game takes away too much choice. But at the same time, I think if you try to be like this, no, 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 this thing is everything to everybody. And we're not going to give you any instruction. And we're just going to let you sort of wander around aimlessly. I think that that is a, a big problem, but I think that's also true, not from just a game design perspective, but from a GM perspective. When a player makes a classic example, when a player makes a recall knowledge check, I, I'm going to be like, I'm going to tell you what you need to know. I'm not going to try to be subtle. I'm not going to try to be vague. I'm not going to try to get you like be blunt. Be like, yeah, you figured it out. Or yes, that is the trap. 
you know, <laughs> that across the room. It's not like, well, it looks very dangerous. And you're like, okay, dangerous because it's a trap or dangerous because I might think it's a trap. Like, what are you trying to tell me here? You're not quite sure, but you think, you know, it's like, just tell me, be blunt because then we can make better decisions. And I think that, that is uh, a more interesting outcome. All right. I'm lost. Okay, lesson number 15. So I created something a while back called Player Psychographics. I took an advertising class I told you earlier. There's a concept in advertising called psychographics where you're trying to understand. And we've talked about these a lot lately on the, the channel. The emotional needs of your audience. Why are they buying your product? And so the idea was I created these three psychographics to explain why our players played the game. What emotionally did they get out of the game? So first, there was Timmy or Tammy. There was Johnny or Jenny. And there was Spike. Okay, so Timmy or Tammy wants to experience something. It's very much about the visceral thrill, the, the excitement, or you know, it could be the emotional bonding with friends. But it was about the, how they felt about it, what, how it made them feel. Jenny or Johnny wanted to express something. The game was about showing other people something about themselves through the lens of the game, through their deck, through cool card combos, through some means by which they can express something about themselves. Spikes want to prove something, that the game is a tool to show that they're capable of doing something. Often winning, but that's not the only thing Spike can be focused on, but they use the game as a resource to prove they're capable of doing something. So let's talk about Ravnica in 2005. We made a card called Molten Sentry, so here's what it did. You flipped the coin when it came into play, and then either you got a five tuning, five power, two toughness, or you got a two power, five toughness. And both of them were interesting, both were balanced, they both were interesting things you could get. So let's look at the psychic graphics and examine this. Uh, I'm gonna take Johnny and Jenny out because this card really isn't for them. Okay, so we got coin flipping. Oh, Timmy likes coin flipping. That's exciting. What's gonna happen? Timmy enjoys that. We had balanced outcomes. Okay, Spike likes that. Spike like both things are good things and I, can, I have interesting choices. Spike enjoys that. But let's flip them for a second. Balanced outcomes. Well, that's not really what Timmy's looking for. Timmy's looking for exciting things. When he flips the coin, ooh, is it a bad thing or a good thing? He wants an exciting moment. And coin flipping, Spike doesn't want to flip a coin. He's all about skill. He, he wants to win the game. Yes, there are interesting choices, but he wants to make the choices. He doesn't want the choices to be random. So what happened when this card came out? The Timmy's didn't like it because it was too spiky, and the Spikes didn't like it because it was too Timmy. You know, that, that the card, like, but trying to make different people happy, we made nobody happy. So lesson number 15 is design the component for the audience is intended for. So, uh, you know, I think that this is, generally speaking, uh, you know, for me, this is like, you know, I think about the Barbarian in Pathfinder 2 versus the Barbarian maybe in 5th edition. Again, I'm not a huge expert in 5th edition. All I can tell you is that uh, my experience with the Barbarian Pathfinder 2, which I've played a lot, is, and I think a lot of people experience this, is the Barbarian 2, uh, Barbarian Path and Pathfinder 2nd Edition is actually a bit of a, a glass cannon. Um, and that is not, you know, that's not what the audience wants out of this, right? The audience who wants to play a Barbarian is playing a Barbarian because they want to, you know, rage and run in there and take up a bunch of damage and soak up a bunch of damage and just be this unstoppable tank right now again in fifth edition you take half damage when you're raging you have resistance to all physical damage that feels pretty freaking good and you know the component of the rage feels like it's building into what people expect out of that experience um and so you know when we talk about timmies and spikes you know there's a lot of instances there where i you know you see a a feat and I, again i think this is an instance where pathfinder 2 does do a good job is they'll show a feat and you'll say I would never take that this feat is terrible, but somebody else will take that feat because they say this feat is perfect. This is exactly what I want. Um, this helps me uh, express my character or this helps me do something with my character. So, you know, I think, you know, a lot of times when, you know, if, if you look at some of our archetypes, we eventually started rating them as a mechanical and a flavor. And I, I, I like that scale because I think the truth of the matter is, Games like Pathfinder 2 actually do a fairly good job of making sure that they design components. Some of them are designed for more maybe spiky character, you know, spiky players who, you know, they want to prove something, they want to win, they want to, uh, you know, crush their enemies. And some people want Timmy, you know, they just want big effects that maybe they're not the most powerful one, but it's going to have the biggest number and the biggest scale and the biggest go burr, right? And then there's people who just want to express something about themselves or their character. And that, you know, that's sort of very much applying to the Johnny. So I think those player psychological profiles map very, very nicely to TTRPGs. Um, now, Shadram is asking, am I a Timmy or a Spike? I'm a Timmy. So Shadram, as I've been saying lately a lot on the Discord, I think for a long time, I thought I was like a Johnny Spike in which that I, I really wanted to you know, a Halo will understand this. I really wanted to get the most experience points in Monster of the Week, um, which only makes sense to her. Um, I wanted to like win the game by expressing myself. And now 
I am finding myself being more of a Timmy, which is crazy. I think I honestly, if I have to say it, I think it's because I've been playing with Bob for so long. And Bob is like a kid in a candy store, right? He just wants to be ood and odd and have fun. And maybe I'm coming down to his level or maybe he's just rubbing off on me. But I find that as I get older, especially, I'm less interested in finding opportunities to express myself and I'm less interested in opportunities to find a way to prove myself. I, I just want to have fun with my friends, you know? I just want to have belly aching laughter moments. I just want to have fantastic high five inducing moments. Um, you know, I've had those happen at my gaming tables over the years and I, I, I would pay almost anything to be able to have those kind of moments on tap, right? I, I just want, you know, to have these incredible moments with my friends before it's, it's all gone. Right. And so for me, I think I have, I have kind of really embraced the sort of Timmy, Timmy lifestyle of, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean I want big numbers go burr. That's a, that's a common mis. That's definitely a type of the Timmy, right? Where they just want the biggest creature with the biggest numbers and the biggest damage. But for Timmy, it's really about because they want to feel something. And that is what I want. You know, I want to feel something. And uh, that is why I, I, I continue to play role-playing games and why I am drawn to them uh, again and again and again. Um, all right. Uh, the next lesson, which we'll skip so that we can go to things, um, which I think is important. Um, now, Mark Rosewater has a great uh, little story here about... Um, uh, creating split cards like fire ice, be more afraid of boring your players than challenging them. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to let him talk uh, about the story here. So at the time, who was in favor of it? I was in favor of it. Bill Rose was in favor. He was the lead designer. Everybody else. Um, and it wasn't, by the way, that they, they were thinking of what was best for magic. They were, were concerned. They felt like that wasn't what a magic card looks like. That, that isn't how we do things. And that it wasn't that the people who were against it, they had the best, the best idea of magic in mind. They were trying to help the game. But they really felt like we were breaking some boundary we, wouldn't, we shouldn't be breaking. But um, Bill and Rich and I, we, we were steadfast, and we slowly convinced everybody that it was the right thing to do. And so eventually in Invasion, the split card came out. What was the player reaction? No. They loved them. They were very, very popular. Um, so much so that we've revisited and done them a, a bunch of different times. So le lesson number 16 is, be more afraid of boring your players than challenging them. So Amen. for 20 years at Wizards, I've done a lot of groundbreaking things. And every time someone, usually multiple people, come, came out of the woodwork full of passion and purpose, and they said to me, you can't do that. It's too risky. It will hurt the game. But interestingly, I've also created my share of boring mechanics. Yet very few people ever had passion and purpose to stop me from making those. Why? Because people fear challenging the players more than boring them. But I think that's backwards. When you try something grandiose and it fails, the players will forgive you because they recognize that you were trying to do something awesome. They respect the attempt. And they stick around to see what you'll do next. But when you bore the players, there's no such forgiveness because making the same mistake is not the same as making a new one. When you bore the players, they resent you. Sometimes they stop playing. So as game designers, I think we have it reversed. Challenging the players isn't the bigger threat. The greatest risk is not taking risks. So lesson number 16, be more afraid of boring your players and challenging them. That I really know there's a lot of risk aversion of, oh no, oh no, what if it goes something wrong? But Respect your players. When you try new and different things, even when you fail, that's better received when you just do boring things. So be willing to challenge your fans. They'll, they'll appreciate it. I only have one word for you on that lesson, okay? And that is kineticist, <laughs> okay? Kineticist, and to me, is an example of class design where they said, you know what? Uh, we're more afraid of boring our players than challenging them or preserving the... It, it, the, book, the book is out. Is the kineticist broken? Who knows? But no one can deny that it's exciting and that they weren't thinking about just sticking, you know, sticking in the lanes because the kineticist looks different and it feels different. It plays different. And maybe it's busted. Maybe it is. I don't know. But, the, you, you know, the fact of the matter is they took a risk. And I think a lot of modern game design, like, he, like Mark Rosewater said, you know, they're more afraid of challenging the players, of challenging the paradigm, of challenging the game. If we bore everybody, that's fine. We just don't want to disrupt the status quo. And Mark Rosewater, and you know, this is true as a GM as well, take risks. People are more than willing to forgive you because you were trying to be awesome. And sometimes you'll miss. 
And again, this comes back to like a lesson that he said earlier, right? It's okay to have, you know, highs and lows, you know, a, a, a parody of experiences. That's fine. Sometimes things are going to, you're going to get it right and it's going to be amazing. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And the people are going to go, this wasn't it. That's okay. You know, even though the naysayers are going to be out there, you know, trying to destroy you and trying to take you out. But at the end of the day, boring players are the ones who, uh, you know, are, are going to be the ones who are going to disengage. They're going to be the players that quit. They're going to be the players that uh, leave the game or leave your campaign. You know, I don't care how uh, cool your campaign is. If the player is bored, they're not going to stick around, right? I, I, I think we can all agree that. Um, <laughs> I wish Paiso saw this before starting a Pathfinder. I'm sure they did. I'm sure. I'm sure they definitely. They they were probably in this audience member. But but you know the reality is of it. Shadram is there's 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 economic concerns as well. And um, you know even though Mark Rosewater, it's, it's easy for him to say because he's creating like a you know billion dollar game or something like Magic. But you know it's not always that easy. Um, you know I think Professor DM by the way just said the other day that he did some math and I think maybe Stephen from RFC. Um, you know, like, um, Pathfinder in 2022. So last year apparently did like $12 million, right? Wizards of the coast did over a billion and just D and D did like 150 or 160 million. So if you just look at the RPG division, like D and D is like what? What is that? Like twelve or thirteen or fourteen times the size of Paizo, right? They don't they don't have the kind of luxury. They kind of have to try to get as many players into their game system as possible. And if that means trying to cast a very broad net, then you know that's gonna you know that's gonna be the case. Um, Kineticist is the best of both worlds. It's definitely busted, but in the funnest way possible, using interesting mechanics that make the class feel unique. Right. No offense to the fighter. The fighter is busted and boring. I played a fighter. I didn't play him one to 20, but I paid him like 10 to 20. He was boring as shit. My turn was the same every turn, right? Move if I wasn't engaged, stride, whatever, uh, double slice, right? And then if I hit with both, I would do that uh, two weapon warrior flensing strike. Like on repeat, added nauseum forever. And it was brutally effective. And my, uh, you know, my, my flails were taking people out. They were getting prone and they were getting crushed and they were getting whatever, you know, it was, it was everything. Um, but, and so it was unbelievably powerful, but it wasn't interesting and it wasn't particularly fun. So, uh, <laughs> multiverse DM, <laughs> it's, it's, it's chill a little bit with the, with the, the game promotion, please. Um, uh, I, I, I'm sure you put a lot of work into your game for sure. And, and if it's coming out or if you've got something that is coming out, you know, uh, we'd be happy to take a look at it, but, uh, you know, we, we don't, I don't need you advertising for it all the time. Um, all right, let's move on. Okay. Last number, lesson number 17, back to invasion. Um, so this was, had a multicolor theme. What that means is that the card had two or more colors in its casting cost and invasion, you were encouraged to play as many colors as you could. So Invasion was very popular. So years later, we wanted to do another multicolor set. Ended up being Ravnica in October of 2005. So the question we said to ourselves is, how can we do another multicolor theme without it being too similar? So let's look at the back of a magic card. This is what we know is the color wheel, or the five colors of magic. So what if we made one small change, we thought? What if instead of encouraging players to play as many colors as possible, all five, we encouraged them to play as few as possible, two. The reason two and not one is it wouldn't be multicolored if it was one. And we looked at that with five colors, we realized that there are 10 combinations. So there were 10 two-color pairs. So we mapped them, and then we made guilds out of them. We gave them each a flavor. Like the Azores, for example, was all about law and order and control. It was white and blue. It took the elements of white and blue, combined them, and they were the, pe they were the people that made the laws in the world, and they were the bureaucrats. And for each of the, the guilds, we gave them a very specific flavor matching that. And then we took the guilds, and we put them in the city world, and we made Ravnica. What was the player response? They loved it. Ravnica is the most popular world we've ever created. The players just ate it up. So lesson number 17 is, you don't have to change much to change everything. So my uh, metaphor here is, I'm a bad cook. So, I mean, a lot of people love Ravnica. I love Ravnica. And the, the fact of the matter is, you know, I think we're all guilty of this. We, we, when we want to change stuff, we want to change a ton of stuff, right? We're like, oh, we need to change this and we need to change this and we need to add this new stuff and we need to add all these new things and we need to change up everything. No, all they needed to do for Ravnica was say, hey, what would it look like if you had groups based around the two colors and you had 10 groups and boom, you get, you know, the, the absolute pinnacle of, of what a lot of people consider magic design. But I mean, you know, 
to the point where if I tell someone who plays Magic the Gathering, oh, you know, that that's a very Golgari card. Or if I tell somebody that's like, oh, that is that is a Rakdos beatdown deck. You know exactly what I mean. And it doesn't just mean colors. It means feel and theme and tone. And it just tells everything. But a lot of times we do way too much, right? We, we want to create this massive monstrosity um, that, that sort of just has just way too much change. You know, when people want to make house rules, they're like, I want to rebuild the whole thing. I want to start from scratch. It's like, no, sometimes you only need to change a couple of things to really make a big difference. Um, and th I think that's an important lesson, you know, to learn because we, we all have, I think, a tendency, especially us quote unquote would be game designers of which I tentatively do not include myself in because I, I'm not so bold, but I, I, we want to change too much. And again, it kind of maybe gets back to, uh, you know, to, to number 12.12, 12, which is, uh, you know, don't design to prove that you can do something. And I think a lot of times people want to change everything because they feel like they can and they should, when in fact, you don't really have to change much uh, to change everything about your game. And I think that that is uh, a pretty important lesson. All right. Lesson 18, let's go. Come on, Mark. Okay, lesson number 18. So every week, I write a weekly design column known as Making Magic. I do 50 new columns a year. I get a two-week break where we rerun columns. And I've been doing this since 2002. So some weeks are theme weeks. I have to write to a theme. It's Goblin Week or whatever. I have to write about goblins. Some weeks are open-ended. I can write whatever I want. Which is harder to write? The theme week or the open-ended week? And we already know the answer to this. The open-ended week. Because the theme week forced my hand and make me four options I might not. So which is harder to design? The theme set or the open-ended set? The open-ended set because the theme set forced me down paths I might not normally have gone. So this gets us to lesson 18, and if you follow my podcast or read my column, this is probably the one I'm most famous for, restrictions breed creativity. Right, so we, we, we talk about this all the time, right? That sometimes being restricted is a good thing. And I personally feel like in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, when people just go, build whatever character you want, you can be whatever ancestries you want, you can be whatever class you want, you can take whatever archetypes you want, you can be, I think that that is going to lead to a, creatively bankrupt game, a creatively bankrupt experience. So there's a myth about creativity that the more options available, the more creative people can be. <laughs> right, myth, you already said myth. Restrictions breed creativity. So there's a myth about creativity that the more options available, the more creative people can be. But this actually contradicts how we know how most brains work. You see, the brain is an amazing organ, it's very smart. So when you're asked to solve a problem, it checks its data banks and it asks itself, have I solved this problem before? And if the answer is yes, it solves it in the exact same way. The exact same way. So what it does is it uses the same neural pathways and does exactly what you did before. Now, most of the time, this is efficient. It lets you avoid relearning tasks each time you do them. But it causes a problem with creative thought because if you use the same neural pathways, you get to the same answers. And with creativity, that's not your goal. So here's the trick I've learned. If you want to get your brain to get to new places, start from somewhere you've never started before. That's why each time I start a new expansion, I make sure to have a different vantage point. You know, I mean, I mean, start from somewhere you've never, and with creativity, that's not your goal. So here's the trick I've learned. If you want to get your brain to get to new places, start from somewhere you've never started before. That statement alone, right, should just scream at you random character creation, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that is definitely something I, I recently talked about, about how when you roll even for random stats, and especially if you like you don't get to put where they go, your, your, your hand is forced. You, you, you have to go down this route. This is, this is what Ben Asaro from our, our Discord always talks about oracles, not the class from Pathfinder 2nd Edition, but the sort of random creation tables. It's what I like about Tome of Adventure design, right? It's a way to force myself into creating something that I wouldn't otherwise create. And I think that that is uh, such an important lesson in gaming is that, uh, you know, restrictions breed creativity. I think not being able to do everything, not having access to everything, that actually, paradoxically, that is what creates the most interesting characters. But I've got $5 from Vin who says I'm wrong. Uh, Derek is 100% wrong. All sources allowed were our funnest and wildest games ever, but we did have to ban some things. Um they were just super hard to GM. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, but being wild and crazy is not necessarily the same thing as being creative. And I'll use a Magic the Gathering example for this. There is a format in Magic the Gathering called Vintage, where very few cards are banned. You can play with any cards in the entire format. It's extremely powerful. 
But I'll also admit that there's not a lot of room to experiment. The cards are so powerful. The solutions are sort of known that if you kind of use anything that's off the beaten path, you're just going to get completely annihilated. Whereas other formats like standard at the, you know, when I used to play standard, that's only the most recently released sets. And they, those change all the time. They rotate old sets, leave standard, new sets, enter standard. So different cards are coming and going. It means that you're always forced to have to be creative because you're restricted. You can't play with just every card in existence. You can only play with a certain subset and standard was the most popular format. It was also the cheapest, but point is, is that it, the fun of standard was those restrictions and trying to solve it despite them. Um, would you say then the goal of most PF2 players that want all the options is not creativity, but to make the thing that they want? It seems like there is a distinction there. Um, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think that, um, well, I guess it depends on how you want to view creativity, right? Um, I think sitting down and being able to make, you know, your perfect character and not have anything disrupt it, uh, I don't, I don't know that that's super creative, you know, um, you have this idea and you're making it right. Like, I, I don't know that like, that's, that's not really forcing you to have to like figure things out. And I think that's the creativity part. Like, I don't think, so I don't think it just means creativity in like a broad sense. I think it means creativity in like a, you're forced to deal with unexpected changes. And I think that's what makes the game very, very interesting. Hoyrit says life path for the win. I love life path systems. We, we never, we haven't really played traveler yet. We just did the character creation process. It was so much fun. Um, I love the life path systems from the um, Warhammer 40 K like the dark heresy and the whatever uh, rogue trader RPGs. I love that life path system. It's so good. Um, stats in order is fantastic. Forces players to come in without a pre-built one to 20 character and actually work with the table on character creation. Yeah. I mean, imagine a world where, I mean, I'm sure people are going to lose their minds here. Imagine a world where you're playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition and your stats were random, but not random in the sense that you would be unplayable, but you didn't get to put them wherever you wanted. And imagine you pick a class and when you level up, okay, randomly, there are like three feats presented to you, right? Not all of them, just three of them. And it's random. And you have to pick one of those three. You can't like retrain it or anything like that. I think a lot of people would lose their mind. They would lose their shit. And it's because, uh, you know, they have this totally perceived concept of what their character is and that's what they want it to do. But when you're forced to sort of take things as they come, you suddenly have to get a lot more creative. You end up with a, a fighter build that you never thought you were going to use. You end up with a fighter who uh, has the gladiator archetype and you have a, you, you're, you have a net and you're fucking using nets to trap people and you know you're like i never thought this was ever going to be even remotely my character uh but it is i don't know i think there's some value in that um <laughs> a roguelike pathfinder second edition <laughs> yeah pathfinder slay the spire edition exactly <laughs> um <laughs> and, and I knew, I knew Vin, I knew Vin would hate that. I knew he, <laughs> drafting for feet sounds horrible. I knew he would hate that. I knew he would hate that. Um, when I play Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I am not trying to be, hold on a sec here. When I am playing Pathfinder 2, I am not trying to be creative anyways. It's PF2 for goodness sakes. It's where creativity goes to die. I just want to make sure the concept I have in my head without having to be creative. <laughs> oh, that's pretty brutal. Um but maybe true a game that does not promote creativity. Um, yeah, again, I guess it depends on how you define creativity. Um, and that's an interesting concept. I mean, I mean, for some people, the creative part of Pathfinder second edition is I have this exact image of my character and the game gives me all these tools, which are all available to me, these feats, these ancestries, these backgrounds, these skill feats, whatever to perfectly mold that character and create exactly the character that I want, you know? Um, and, uh, I, I, I don't know that that is, you know, a hundred percent true, but I mean, I will say, you know, modern games, you know, uh, Kyle here is bringing up, you know, 4E, um, you know, 4E, uh, 
you know, pet point buy system and, you know, you could take different powers and, you know, a lot of the randomness from the game uh, in terms of being able to quote unquote build your character uh, was taken out. And, um, I, you know, that was sometimes something I think I felt a little bit right. Um, you know, fourth edition characters, fourth edition, this is something that my, my group absolutely hated this. Okay. Aaron especially hated this. Now, nowadays this seems like common sense. This is great. This is classic GM advice. Fourth edition said, Hey, look, players in D and D get magic items. So we expect players to have magic items and we expect players to have a plus one sword or a plus two armor or whatever at certain levels. Pet, sound familiar? Pathfinder two, but fourth edition went a step further. It said there's other items too, that your characters might want. And as a GM, the way that they get those items that they want for their characters is through adventuring. So, you should collect, and they literally call them this, wish lists from your players, like a fucking Christmas wish list that they'll update every couple levels with new items that they become interested in. And your job as a GM is to find that they work themselves and, you know, in some way, shape, or form into the campaign. Uh, and to be fair, that, that works perfectly well with the way that fourth edition is designed. Fourth edition is designed to that sort of like, Hey, I want this item that is going to complement my character's role or my character's thing or whatever I'm trying to do. But I will tell you my players, I, I was sort of neutral on it. I was the GM, but my players hated it. And especially Aaron, they thought it was horrible and terrible. They wanted random magical items. Like we've been playing since, you know, D and D, you know, uh, um, since, since D and D second edition, uh, AD and D second edition, first edition. Now to be clear, Think about it this way. Think about it this way. Think about it this way. Um, <laughs> pumpkin's off to get one piece. Take care, buddy. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Now, to be clear, back we talked about this before. In first edition AD and D, you're going to the you're going to the dungeon. Your fighter has a sword and a shield, and he's battling, and you're fighting your way through the uh, through the dungeon. And then you come across an ancient shrine to a long forgotten sea god and you defeat the slimy tentacled creature which pulls itself up from the briny pool that occupies the shrine. And upon the creature's demise, you see glittering at the bottom of the pool a gleaming silver trident. And upon removing it and casting spells of identification upon it, you discover this is a plus two trident. Holy shit, your whole world just changed. And you know what your fighter does? He grabs that fucking trident and he goes to town with it because his character lets him fight with all weapons. Well, you could do that in Pathfinder 2, can't you? You could do that in AD&D 3rd Edition, can't you? Yes, except no. You see, my favorite weapon is sword. And I took feats that are only designed for sword and board and one-handed. And I have weapon focus only in swords. And my, my expert proficiency, my master level proficiency is only with the sword group, not with the spear group. So I can't do anything with this. Oh, that's okay. Well, you're right. You're right. So we'll change the rules. Now it doesn't even matter what you find because now all the coolness in a weapon is actually in the runes. The sword itself, the trident, it's a piece of garbage. Throw it away. It's the runes. We'll peel those off and stick them onto your sword and that way you can keep doing your sword. So original D&D &D was more random and sometimes you had to come up with crazy, you know, I, I, I had characters in early versions of the game that had just but literally bonkers, weird ass equipment loadouts because that those were the magic items that they found. And there was no magic item shops to buy new ones. To be honest with you, there wasn't even magic item shops to sell the ones that you got. You got what you got and you tried to make it work. And there was a fun in that, right? The restrictions kind of bred creativity. All right. All right. Rule 19. Now, this is, a shout, this is a shout out to all of us. This is a shout out to you. Yes, you, okay? Your audience is good at recognizing problems and bad at solving them. Mark Rosewater gives a great example of going to a doctor. When you go to see a doctor, the first thing that they usually ask you is, how are you feeling? What's going on? What's hurting? What's different? What don't you like? Because they understand that you, as a patient, are good at recognizing your own problems. What's wrong? But your doctor typically is not going to ask you, well, what do you think we should do about it? What 
medicine or surgical procedures should we involve, right? That's where they, the professional, um, are better at solving them. And Mark Rosewater here is speaking to an audience full of game designers or would-be game designers. And he's basically saying, the audience is gonna give you great feedback and that is absolutely something you should listen to. But they're really bad at solving them. Your audience tends to have very little understanding of the full depth and complexity and nuances of your game. And while they may be very good, they are actually really good at relink. This doesn't work. This isn't compelling. This doesn't feel powerful enough. That is great, but they are not good at solving them. And, you know, you look, have to look no further than, you know, all of these games that seem to be being designed by committee or designed by poll. You know, my, I'm looking at you, fifth edition, 5.5 or whatever, where they're basically seemingly outsourcing the design of their game to public opinion polls, right? So I think that's a really good piece of advice. And I, I, I definitely think that uh, all of us should take that in mind, not only as we, you know, issue criticism to uh, uh, the games that we do play, but when we think about, you know, uh, how we're going to go ahead and solve issues that we see in our problem. Maybe we think something's a problem, but until you really have put yourself into that driver's seat, it can be difficult to, to solve them. Ayla. The five dollar super chat. Thank you. Got a dip for Monster of the Week. I'll let you know how my quest to power going game PBTA goes. Doing it right. I'll catch the rest in the VOD. There shouldn't be too much rest, Ayla. But thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. Appreciate it. Um, all right. The last lesson. All the lessons connect. So it's kind of a cop out. It's really only nineteen. But you know, we we kind of already talked about this a little bit tonight. We've mentioned how some of these lessons all sort of interact with each other. And it's not really 19 separate lessons. It's sort of just one gigantic lesson. And you can see where, you know, a designer might be trying to prove something. And so, in, and so instead they make something interesting instead of making it fun, right? And you can see where all these lessons sort of integrate and, and kind of connect back to each other. And I think it's something that, you know, uh, and this is just the tip of an iceberg of why I am so hesitant to, you know, people are like, oh, Derek, you should make a game. Derek, you should rebuild Pathfinder and make Nightfinder. And you guys should make something. You know, we, we've we've talked for years about doing our own hack of uh, of Torchbearer plus Dungeon World plus like kind of maybe Blades in the Work Dark and something um, plus elements from like D twenty. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I really respect that game design is really really hard. And it's very easy to do it badly. And so, yeah, you know, um, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's important that uh, we, we respect the craft, right? And we try to make sure that we're not just, you know, again, 19, we're the audience. We're good at recognizing problems. We're bad at solving them. We have to consider the fact that oftentimes we are only seeing a smallest part of a, of an interconnected whole. We need to be really respectful of that. So I think that everybody, I think game design should absolutely be something that people think about if you're interested in it, but I, don't, I, I think you should respect it as, as both an art and a science. And uh, you know, there's, there's, there's reasons why there are college level courses for this stuff um, because it's not just for TTRPGs, but it's for, you know, um, you know, games as well. And I mean, to be fair, everybody can be a game designer, but it, it's just really easy to be a bad game designer, right? Hey, Mast Fam, twenty dollars for making it to twenty. I like your logic. I appreciate you. Thank you, Mast Fam. Um, we did do it. We only went twenty minutes over, so that's not too bad. Um, and we even got to show you know a bunch of Mark Rosewater stuff. So I thought that was really really good. Um, and of course, as as a perfect example of this, uh, you know, uh. We did not talk about Pathfinder second edition tonight. Um, and so we had about half the viewers that we had from Tuesday. So I want to say special shout out to everybody who came out tonight, who might be watching this video because um, this, this is what we call a Patreon video. Okay. Um, these are the videos that I am able to do because number one, I don't have a, this is, you know, content creation is my full-time job, but number two, most importantly, we have an incredible Patreon. Night's the last call is not me. Night's the Last Call is not me and Bob and Aaron. Night's the Last Call is the community that we've built. And uh, in fact, when you join 
at anything other than, you know, our minimal level, we call you a knight. Some people think that's really confusing because we're like, wait a second, aren't you the knights? No, we're, we're all the knights. There are people in my community who I think are better and smarter and more capable in many aspects of GMing and design than I am. I learn from them all the time. They're incredible, uh, amazing people. And, you know, part of the reason our community is so strong is because our community is kind of small. We don't allow anybody in it. You have to be a member of the Patreon. And I mean, you know, you put some skin in the game. It might only be three or five bucks a month, but we find that that tends to keep people pretty tight and focused. We have an adult, mature audience who's capable of disagreeing and debating. People definitely come to my Discord to 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 tell me I'm wrong. And you know what? I, I appreciate the hell out of it. So um, it's an incredibly rewarding place. And, you know, again, I cannot thank everybody enough uh, for the incredible support that they've given us in, in that regard, because it lets us do these streams where, you know, maybe only 50 or 40 or 50 or 60 people come out, but we can have cool conversations and we can learn stuff and we can really, really, really uh, dive into, you know, maybe it's not the most popular stuff, but I think it's interesting. And I think that is, uh, you know, that is definitely worth something. Um, all right, let me see here. Catching up with the chat. Uh, da, da, da. The true 20th lesson was the friends we made along the way. Absolutely, Hoyrit. Fantastic. Um how would you feel about a voting system for a group trying to determine the DC of a task, like how they do it with sprint planning and scrum? Ian, that's you basically just described how kind of I set DCs in Blades in the Dark games. Like I might say, okay, you're you know jumping off the roof and you're uh, trying to land safely on the street below. I don't know. I, I think that sounds like a pretty desperate maneuver with limited effect. Wouldn't you agree? And they might go, no, 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 no. You described how the, the street had all these, um, you know, carts and, uh, 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 you know, shops. And I'm, I'm envisioning there being all these balconies and cloth banners and maybe clothes lines and maybe a big cart full of hay or something. I'm imagining a scene where like my character is sort of like hitting every balcony and every cloth, uh, you know, covering, uh, awning on the way down and then landing in the, I go, Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I like what I'm picking up what you're putting down here. I think that makes sense. All right. We'll change it. We'll make it, we'll, we'll make it just a risky uh, proposition that with a standard effect, does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds good. Does that sound good with everybody else? Yeah. Okay, cool. Make the roll. We, we do that all the time. Hey, Trey, thank you so very, very much. Thanks. Thanks for the stream. Thanks for your incredible donation. Thank you so much. We, uh, we hit our goal, our super chat goal. So there you go. We're going to take, we're going to, you guys approve that we're going to take a little bit of a holiday break. So, um, you know, later this month, I was debating, you know, like, you know, Thursdays, uh, in two Thursdays, we've got Thanksgiving. Um, it's always tough to take a break. You know, these streams are, are good for our bottom line. Um, but you know what? Uh, we'll definitely um, uh, uh, maybe take some time off. At the very least, I'll let Bob and Aaron, you know, have some time with their families uh, <laughs> as we go into the holiday stress system. So looking forward to that. And thank you so much for that, Trey. Really, really appreciate it. That is a very generous donation. And I appreciate uh, your continued support for what seems like forever. Um, let me take a look here. Um, yeah. Um, Trey has been a member of the Knights of Last Call Patreon for almost two years um, and is currently an exalted member of our, uh, uh, one of our elite exalted members of our Patreon. So thank you so much, Trey. Um, Ryan, thank you. Excalibur, Mjolnir, the Sword of Omens. These are not random loot. Um, I agree, Ryan, and I, I, I actually think that that's okay. I think there's a distinction in D&D &D between random loot and like known items that the party deliberately wants to go and find because they're so powerful and because they're so legendary. Um, you know, in classic D&D, we didn't have Excalibur or Mjolnir, but you had things like, especially in the early version of the game, you know, things like the flame tongue, right? Meant something. That was a, that was like the D&D equivalent of like a named blade that had this power that went beyond simple, you know, uh, uh, you know, stats and bonuses. There was a difference between a flame tongue and a flaming sword. And those are the type of things that when I was, you know, growing up, we would put 
uh, you know, we would put I, I, a rumor that somewhere in the dungeon or whatever was a, you know, flame tongue. And players would be like, man, that, that might, that might become one of my character's goals is to recover this awesome sword and wield it. And it's like, dude, I thought you, I thought you used maces or hammers. It's like, nah, dude, I, I want the flame tongue. I want to change the way that my character's approached. Swing Ripper said, are we at the point where he talks about Gristlebrand being eight mana instead of seven mana value? Swing Ripper, that was like lesson number two or three. And yes, we covered it and we talked about it. And that is an absolutely perfect example of where the aesthetics matter. And, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, but he did talk about it. Um, aha, yes. The Holy Avenger. I mean, my God, what a, you know, what a, what a, what a, that, that, that name alone for people who've been playing the hobby for a long time. I mean, that means something. Um, the sun sword, right? If you've played any sort of Ravenloft, then you know that the sun sword really, really stands out. Uh, yeah, uh, that is a particularly funny moment for me as well because I remember that that bothered me to no end. I, I, I hated that it was all sevens except for this random, that it cost eight. Like, it, I'm not even OCD, but it, it definitely triggered me. <laughs> uh, um, and yeah, so I, I, you know, again, I grew up playing Final Fantasy one, which was like my, my introduction to council RPGs. You know, you're playing Final Fantasy one, you're oh, okay, cool. I got the rapier and now I've got the silver sword from Elf Town. And then, oh, I found the giant slayer sword. Sweet. I'm going to equip that. Oh, I found the frost sword. Oh, I found the wear blade. Oh, I found the, you know, and then at the end of the game, you get, you know, mass immune or uh, you get Excalibur and it's awesome. Like that to me, I, I don't know. I think that's a fun part of the game. Uh, Ian says, I like, I feel like the serendipitous upgrades to other weapon styles was a classic, uh, st staple of classic CRPGs like Final Fantasy one, which I was just talking about. My experience with old RPG video games was always stumbling across an item that made me change my build. And again, that's where I like that restrictions breed creativity. I, I like when the campaign, right? Let's put it this way. This is, this is uh, regardless of, uh, of our lessons here for me what I want as a GM, okay, what I want as a GM and what I want as a player is I, the player, want to change the campaign. And I, I mean that in a meaningful way, okay? I don't just mean go through the adventure, kill the NPCs I'm supposed to kill, right? Go to the next trail in the line of breadcrumbs. I want to change the campaign in a way, almost in basically in a way that the GM did not expect me to. But as a GM, I want the campaign to change the players and the player character. I want the events of the world to make a difference. And I think that there are many people out there who, regardless of what happened in a campaign, they were going to take the same feats at the same level and they were going to get the same magic items regardless. It does. They could be playing rise of the rune Lords, Asians of X walk edge watch quest for the frozen flame. It, it does, you know, strength of thousands. It doesn't matter. They're going to build the character that they want to build as a GM. I, I feel like I would be a failure if that happened, because again, my job as a GM, I feel like is to have the campaign change the players and change the player characters. And as a player, I feel like, you know, my job is for me to change the world, to change the campaign that I'm playing in, to make a meaningful difference. Again, to literally take it in a direction that the game master or any of the other players was not expecting. I think that is very, very, very satisfying. And, you know, it's that, you know, it's that give and take. Um, yeah. Swing Ripper calls it push and pull. And I, and, and, and I agree the characters in the settings, I mean, these, especially in D and D right that where maybe not at level one, but maybe on a local setting, but your characters go from, you know, from zero to hero to superhero. And they're, they're the big protagonists. They, they should be the movers and shapers of the, of the setting. Uh, whatever that size and scope might be, there should be the very real sensation that as a player, you have that power to sort of, to change things for, for good or for bad. Right. Um, and you know, to the point where I like the idea that, <laughs> you know, Hey heroes, you failed. Um, and so there are consequences. I mean, 
I, I'm going to pick on something very specifically here. We've been playing Abomination Vaults the last couple uh, months on our Fridays. Uh, the party is now on to level seven or eight um, of the dungeon. Uh, yes, they're on level eight. They just finished level seven. So that's the end of book two. We're starting book three. So they're going to be on level eight. And there is something that really kind of comes up a lot of times. We kind of nod our heads, which is minor spoiler alert, but the villain of the adventure again goes from level one to 10. So that gives you an indication of how powerful the final boss is probably. Um, her intention is to use the power of her dungeon and all the evil stuff that I won't get into um, to rise up and destroy Absalom, which is just down the road from Otari. Absalom, you know, Absalom, the place where there's probably more level 20 NPCs and 15 NPCs, right? It's a level 20 city. It might even be higher level than that. I don't know, but it, it's the, you know, it is, it's kind of like a joke where, you know, they basically feel like, uh, you, you know, like if you read the box set for Absalom, there, there, there's that area outside of the city walls where like, demonic armies have marched on the walls and they all got destroyed. And it's just like a barren field of like vacated siege engines and, you know, bones of monsters that are bleaching under the sun. Right. Like it, it, it just seems incredible uh, that she could do that. And, you know, this is, this is kind of my problem with some modern fantasy games, uh, like not the game, the systems themselves, but the world, you know, cause Bruno says maybe if she wins, she will power up and be level 25. Then you shouldn't be trusting that to level three characters, right? The character should go, Hey, there's a real, there's a real threat here. And we're just level three. We're going to go to Absalom. We're going to find high level, good aligned characters who want to do the right thing. And we're going to tell them that there is a super minor threat that they could deal with in half a second. But if they don't act, she will rise up and destroy them. Like you've ch now granted that might be an awesome part of campaign, like what a fun, but it's clearly not what the, you know, the adventure writers intended for this to happen. Um, and, and it just, it, again, it creates this kind of weird dissonance where like the heroes are basically like, well, we're going to keep going in this dungeon selfishly. Well, wait, aren't you going down there to destroy Belcora? Yeah, but we're really being selfish when you think about it because uh, we should just go tell, you know, the powers that be to go wipe out everything in the dungeon and deal with the threat. Um, but we we want the treasure and we want the experience. Um, and so we're, we're not we're not going to do that. So it's kind of a weird it's just sort of a weird setting from that perspective. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, the city that the whispering tyrants themselves failed uh, to destroy. And this is a big reason, Ryan, why I do not, do not like the Forgotten Realms. The the high-level NPCs in the Forgotten Realms are everywhere. They're way too ubiquitous, um, whether we're talking about, you know, the Chosen of Mistra, you know, the Seven or whatever, um, you know, Elminster, Kelvin, R.I.P., you know, just like all these characters, Dritz Jordan, like it's, it's, it, you can't, you know, you know, they even did this, they even did this in the D&D movie, where like the lower level party was like, hey, let's go get a higher level NPC who's really cool and impressive and has a way more interesting backstory than any of the rest of us and, uh, you know, goes and, uh, you know, takes them out. Um, but the question, Ryan, is who is your favorite seven? Uh, who is your favorite sister of the seven? I know mine. Um. Uh, let's see. Yes. Epic magic is also supposed to be rare. That is true. But I mean, if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be an Absalom. Ooh, interesting. Interesting choice. No, uh, my answer is of course the symbol just because she's a badass. Um, uh, I think her real name's like Alara or something or, uh, uh, Alaria or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, the witch queen of Aglarond. Um, very cool. Uh, but anyways, yeah, those characters are really interesting. But okay, isn't it supposed to be about the PCs, right? Like, you know, I... I, <laughs> I loathe the Forgotten Realms. Here's the thing. Like, I like the Forgotten Realms as a 
alternate bibliography slash glossary slash index slash appendix to read. I, I like a lot of the novels that are written there. Um, I've read, you know, most, if not all the Dritz books, although there's probably like 30 now that I haven't read because I haven't read them in like 10 years. Um, you know, I've read uh, Time of Troubles and, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. Cleric's Quintet, um, some of the other ones. But point is, I like it as a storytelling setting. I just don't think I want to play D&D &D there, right? Because it, it, it's it's been there and it's done that, you know? Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's a particularly interesting campaign setting. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it, again, you can't go 10 feet without hitting a level, you know, 15 character. Like it doesn't have to be that high level um, before, you know, it it becomes out of out of spec. Um, well, Swing says PF2E does have does not really try to hide that potent magic happens in higher level settlements. We even have a gold price to have someone cast a wish for you. Absolutely. Right. Like it, it, it is commoditized. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you even think about it when you think about high level characters, like imagine being an 18th level PC, right? 17th level PC, whatever. Okay. And you're in town. Uh, I don't know. You're, for whatever reason, you got some downtime, right? You're whatever. And uh, somebody comes in and they ask you to do something for them that literally would take something like your fourth or fifth or sixth level spell slot, right? It's just some random NPC who's asking you to do something. Like, that doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't, like, drain you of your magical power. And you're, it's almost like kind of like you're like, yeah, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, like, uh, uh I'll go help you out. I don't care. Like, like a PC would do that most of the time, especially if they were like good aligned and the person was like, Hey, I need your help. Like they wouldn't even think twice. They would just be like, okay, I go and do that. Like if you were a high level cleric and you were sitting in town recovering and somebody came to you and said, you know, Oh, I'm so sorry to bother you, my Lord, but uh, my son is very ill and he's dying of a, of a totally curable disease. You know, he's failed several fort saves and he's, he's on stage four and at stage five, he dies. You know, is there anything you could do? to help him and the cleric is going to go absolutely that's like a no level spell like i'll i'll come i'll i'll go to your son you know goes in there cast it cures the son brings back their other dead son from the dead you know brings back the dad who died in war a couple years ago from the dead just you know i don't know gives them i don't know 5000 gold pieces cuz that's like a rounding error on his character sheet just totally changes their life like it's just completely and I can tell you there are so many PCs that I have literally personally seen do this exact same thing where like just the idea of being able to go in and just throw a hundred thousand gold pieces to the, to the people of this town is just funny to them. They're like, Hey, let's teleport there. You know, let's go, let's teleport back to Sandpoint and just like give everybody a thousand gold. Cause that'd be awesome. Right. And, and they do it. Um, you know, uh, this story has been told before, so I'll tell it very quickly. But we played a Dragonlance campaign um, a long time ago and uh, at low level starting. And I, I allowed everybody to start with a magical item. And they had to give me a story about where the magic item came from, right? That was the only qualification. And so, like, uh, Aaron, you know, started with this sword, this magical great sword. It was his father's sword, uh, the last line of an ancient elven group of defenders called the Blade Singers, right? Really cool story. You know, not nothing super deep, but, you know, something. And then my buddy, Justin, who doesn't play games with us anymore, uh, he, he's moved away a long time ago, but he said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm starting with this um, magical hammer or magical axe. And I go, okay, what's your story? And he goes, ah, I found it on the side of the road. I go, that's your story? He goes, yeah, you know, some high level character didn't want it and he threw it down and I found it. Uh, and I was like, that is so lame. Nope, nobody does that, it, you know? We played this campaign for years, and as the campaign was coming to an end, they were kind of taking that final trip back to their starting town uh, to maybe, you know, sort of break the fellowship, you know, right? you know, uh, you know everybody's going to go their separate ways and become great lords and ladies and kings and queens of the land or whatever, and they were going to have, like, one last, you know, hurrah. And, like, as, like, the session was even wrapping down, like, uh, my friend Justin stuff, he goes, hey, 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 wait, there. As we're going into town, uh, I take... I take uh, my hammer and uh, it, which was like a really high level hammer at this point. And he goes, I throw it down on the side of the road. <laughs> it was like, it was like the longest 
joke punchline of all time. Um, anyways, so yes, he he absolutely did it, and and we were, of course all dying of laughter because like some people didn't even some people had like joined the campaign in the intervening years and didn't even understand why that was funny. Um, but I thought that was like just chess kiss. But but that's my point, right? Like the the especially in Pathfinder Second Edition where the money is, you know, geometric. Um, I go into the town, I buy everybody a plus one sword. Hey, adventurers, everybody starts with plus one swords in this town. Um, it, it just means nothing. So anyways, the point is magic is cheap. Magic is free. Um, you know, magic is readily available. So it's not even an issue. Um, uh, all right. Um, <laughs> wish should cost you three years of your life and need to make a system shock check. I guess wish you die. End of the campaign. Um, There is the opportunity cost of a caster who is filling themselves with their slots of these things. Ian, only if they're planning on going and venturing like the same day. If you're a prepared caster, like a cleric, you could just be like, hey, today I'm going to memorize 38 cure diseases and go to town on this town. And then tomorrow I'll memorize a bunch of heals and heroisms and all the stuff that I need to for us to do the adventure with. I mean, most people just hand wave that stuff anyways. And even if we're talking about an opportunity cost, maybe even not because a lot of clerics are going to have a feat that lets you convert your heal spells into, uh, you know, cure diseases and remove afflictions. And anyways, point is it, there really is no cost. Um, let's see. And, and this is true, Ian, in the lore, having teleport used on you is the equivalent of having a private jet sent to you. And you're absolutely right, Ian, but that is absolutely not how the mechanics treat teleport in the in the fiction. I um, mean, to the point where you have literally creatures that could like teleport without, you know, without like at will. Um, that's interesting. Level cap on your humanoids. Um, yeah, basically, Cephalodog adventurers in campaign settings are like, you know, our world's super wealthy billionaires who keep all their money so that they can have really expensive toys that they don't need instead of, you know, helping out the common person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm playing PF2 again, and a number of scrolls my guys uh, uh, have could be mapped on an asymptotic curve. Yeah, I mean, scroll, scroll bloat is definitely a thing. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? People have talked about this for years, you know, Michael, like, you know, when we talk about making it interesting and, you know, but when we talk about th making something interesting and not fun, like I'll give you a great example, like encumbrance, right? Now encumbrance is interesting, but it's not fun. And it's like, if you're playing, let me, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about encumbrance. Encumbrance used to be fun, not in the way that you're thinking. Encumbrance used to be fun because there was a tension. Your character could only carry so much weight and food mattered. Light mattered. There was no dark vision back then. Okay. The infravision sucked. You needed lights. You needed torches and lanterns and oils. You needed food. You needed water. You needed ammunition. So there was only so much gear that you could hold. So that became a very real sense of how much you could, you know, matter, you know, gather, but you also needed in order to level, you needed to return from town with gold and gold and treasure and jewels. And that shit was heavy. So encumbrance was this sort of weird resource allocation problem where you wanted ideally to bring in a backpack full of everything that you needed in order to survive and have it bleed off equipment and then fill in the void that was being left behind with treasure that you were finding. But if there ever got out of whack, like if you found a bunch of treasure all at once, you're not going to leave it there. That's gold and experience. Now the game becomes, what do we drop? Man, I wish, I wish, I, I, I wish I was stronger so we could carry more encumbrance. I wish we, I wish the wizard had tensors floating disc so that we could pile another couple thousand gold onto the tensors floating disc and take it back to the town so that we could gain experience. So the encumbrance became this entire like sub game right of yes accounting i'm not trying to say it was the most thrilling things ever okay but the fact of the matter was it mattered now because gold mattered weight mattered and you needed all that for experience you get to pathfinder second edition it has encumbrance why but we simplified it we made it bulk why does it ever matter ever anyone ever 
Has it ever mattered? I don't think it has, you know? Um, and, and, you know, especially too, as someone pointed out here in those olden days, you couldn't just be like, until you get a bag of holding. Cause that wasn't something, there was no magic item chart. There was no guarantee of it. You couldn't put, you couldn't put bag of holding on your wish list, right? Nowadays you can, or, and because bag of holding isn't like, uh, you know, a, a, a flaming rune, it's way lower level and super affordable. And you're absolutely right. Once you get a bag of holding, it stops mattering entirely. And they removed that part of the game completely. What's interesting, Shadram, is that back in the day, because experience points in first edition D&D continued to double for a very significant point of time, and because you needed gold in order to get experience points, you got to the point where you literally needed tens of thousands of gold in order to level, which meant that in a weird way, you almost kind of, even if you got the bag of holding, it's almost like you needed the bag of holding just to carry how much treasure you needed in order to be able to level. So there was almost an element of where like the bag of holding was sort of just like a, oh, cool, nice. We, we might be able to actually carry enough of this gold to maybe level up. Um, um, <laughs> this is true, Ian. There's a weird caveat that if every adventurer stopped adventuring, then they could no, no, no. They they can keep adventuring until they get to twentieth level. Then they can finally retire. Um, I mean, whenever there is a world-ending threat, why doesn't somebody else who's already level twenty go deal with it? That seems to make more sense, doesn't it? Um, and I agree with that, Bruno, completely. Ian, no, you don't. No, you don't, Ian. No, you don't. You don't <laughs> I do no I you do not it exists to stop encumbrance exists to stop tower shield users from having full plate <laughs> right but is that is that really so bad I don't think it even is that bad who cares if the full plate guy has a tower shield who cares who cares um <laughs> yes exactly it's stupid um <laughs> Even leveling was paid. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Yes, it was. Um, yeah, um, we had in like our last Pathfinder one campaign, uh, we had a, a Tim, Tim Carpenter, you know, played uh, Gwildor and uh, Breck in our quest for the Frozen Flames game. Uh, Gwildor, uh, or sorry, Tim, made a character named Horus, and Tim really liked the Favored Soul, which was a third edition uh, class. It was kind of like a sorcerer cleric, um, but had like some fighter elements to it, And uh, but they didn't exist in Pathfinder. There was only the Oracle, but we didn't like the Oracle. So um, we made this, we made a custom class, which was the Favored Soul uh, in Pathfinder 1, and his character ended up... Um, wielding a uh, a tower. He was a cleric. It was a favorite soul. Basically he could cast divine spells spontaneously, but he had a tower shield and he wielded a, like a staff in one hand. Um, and again, it was because of just random shit that happened and stuff that he acquired. But I always thought that that was like, and like his tower shield was like this unbelievable defensive bastion. It was actually really, really, really sweet. Like it could do like all sorts of crazy, ridiculous stuff. Um, because we had this whole reaction system, but basically like his character could like kind of do what the champion does in Pathfinder two, but he could do it uh, several times uh, around uh, every round and usually block for a lot more. Um, anyways, it was really sweet. Um, Two dollars. Shout outs to Tim and the favored soul, which was a great class. Hope he's well. Yeah. Tim's doing great. Um, he's actually going to be moving. He currently lives on the west side of our town. He's actually going to be moving back to the east side of the town where all of us live. Obviously, you know, he's still got his job and his kids and his life, but we are hoping that means that we're going to be able to uh, hang out with him a bit more and at least play games with him a bit more. So um, who knows? Maybe he'll even pop in uh, on the studio streams from time to time. So definitely, yeah, we, we, we love Tim and he's a big part of the He's a big part of the uh, gaming group that I've have had for the last 20 plus years. So um, that alone feels weird. You know, that was one of the, that was like the first house rule um, that I ever made is uh, in thing. I said, 
if your character has the powerful fist ability, AKA you're a monk, I let you, if you had an open hand, okay, a free hand, I would let you take an interact action or not an interact action, whatever. Uh, you could take an action to gain a plus two circumstance bonus to your armor class. Basically, I let monks raise a shield without actually needing to have a shield just because it bothered me so much, the mental image. There was no reason why a, a monk shouldn't have a shield just in case you needed plus two AC, but I hated the mental image of it so badly that I, I just let them, if they had a free hand, they could, as an action, uh, you know, go into a defensive posture or something and get plus two circumstance bonus to their AC um, until the start of the next turn because I couldn't stand it. Um, Derek, what is the longest campaign you have ever run? Great question. Uh, it's one of two. It's either my fourth edition. My, it's either my fourth edition campaign, um, which was uh, one to level one to level thirty, and that was probably about. You know, it's probably over a hundred sessions um, when you when you when you take it all into consideration. And we weren't playing every single week, so it probably took close to two and a half years, maybe three years, to maybe two and a half years to finish it. The only other one that could compete with that was my Pathfinder One campaign called Dragon's Delve, which was a twenty-level mega dungeon that had like ten or something side levels. Um, this is the campaign that uh, our Pathfinder characters were Pathfinder characters with an additional system of action points with an additional system of a reaction system. Oh, and they eventually got mythic ranks. So I think they ended the campaign at like 20th level plus mythic rank. Um, that game was our backup game because Aaron was the primary GM at the time. And so we would play it on and off. And there were times where we like, we wouldn't play it for a month or more, but then there were also times where we play it multiple times per week, sometimes with different groups. So it was kind of West marches in that way. And that probably took like over three years to finish before they, you know, beat the campaign and killed the big dragon at the bottom of the, of the dungeon. But we weren't playing constantly throughout that time period. So yeah, I would, I would say, you know, two and a half to three years is about the longest campaign I've ever done. Ryan says, by the way, it's Laralel, Laralel Silverhand, because I like the picture on page 65 of the AD and D second edition heroes lore book. All right. I actually think I own that. I just don't know where it is. It's just, it's sad that I, I, I'm like, oh man. I thought this was it, but it's, it, this is just the villain's lore book. The villains were in Forgotten Realms were pretty sweet too. These were cool books. I know, I know exactly what the Heroes Lore book looks like too. I, I know it's on my shelf somewhere. I just, God help me, I don't know where it is. All right. Anyways, um, let's see. Uh, my favorite was I was just playing Brom League of Legends with a big shield and mountain stance. Uh, I don't know League of Legends, so I don't know who Brahm is, but um, essentially I made the mountain stronghold default. Dope. You know, so here, here's another problem that I had. Here's another problem that I had. There were a lot of changes I made because I didn't know how the, you know, I didn't know every single thing in the game and the APG came out pretty quick and I, I didn't like pick it up real like right away. There were a lot of like little house changes that I made in the game. And then somebody basically goes, oh, that that's a class feature. That's a feat. You know, like I remember I was like, you know, it's weird to me that everything in this game has an effect on critical hits uh, or critical failures, except for attack rolls. And like, I didn't like people spraying, praying, and I wanted to give um, bosses, uh, you know, higher level monsters a little bit more punch. So I was like, oh, if you critically, this is true for anybody. If you critically miss with an attack roll, then the person you're critically attacking can use a reaction to uh, attack you back sort of like a, you know, a fumble, and then they get to pounce on your attack that you failed. And that was like, and of course, like, someone's like, oh yeah, that's, that's a, that's a swashbuckler power. And it's like a level 10 feet. And I was like, oh, I was giving it to everybody at level one. So like any, <laughs> this, this kind of gives you an indication of like where I, uh, you know, where, where, 
<laughs> where my idea of what balance is and what the idea of the game's balance is, I'm like, oh, I would give this to everybody. And the game's like, oh, no, no, this is only for one class. And it, it, it is it is all it is a 10th level feat. Um, uh, let's see. I was able to break the 30 AC barrier at six. That's impressive. Usually you have to get to seven, right? To be a champion at seven you can get to 30 AC with the shield raised. Until my enemy learned my weakness. Walk around the guy spending 17 actions raising a slab of metal. Right, which is the classic problem with any sort of defensive character in Pathfinder 2. It, it is, I mean, yes, if the GM goes, hey, look, there's the AC 31 guy who raised his shield. All my people are going to go attack you. Like, that That could feel pretty cool, especially when they all miss. Um, of course, that's naturally when they roll a bunch of 20s and you go, Why, what, are, what are we even doing here? How is it that not only did not only did I get hit, but somehow I got crit, which did double damage. And by the way, me getting crit does as much damage as if I was naked. Doesn't it feel right? That is something I've I've actually always had a problem with with D and D, uh, a big time. It's like it just the 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 dissonance between being like this guy needs a nineteen to hit me, right? Like I'm so far beyond him, and you're like, okay, well, a twenty still crits you, and not only that, it still does double damage, knocks you prone, and sets you on fire, and you know it's like. The, the the distinct the level of difference between those two things is, is way too way too high for me um yes uh, although I that Marshall wasn't that great that Marshall used all the auras um I think that I think it's from the it's from the is it from the D d miniatures handbook is that what the favorite souls from the D d minis handbook or something like that um yeah I I, I that Marshall never really I I, I Fourth edition for me is the first Marshall. Although, actually, the White Raven school from uh, Book of Nine Swords really is, if you really think about it, the first Marshall. Um, Repost makes bosses so much more terrifying. Yeah, it's okay. Best villain, Deirdre Kendrick, the chick on the cover of the villain's lore book. There we go. You can tell, you can tell this book came out in the 90s because, well, let's just say the ladies... Fairly revealing there. Yeah. This is a cool book. Don't make them like this anymore. Um, let's see here. <laughs> the ability to craft shoddy items should have been a subsystem instead of locked behind an architect. If I recall correctly, Favored Soul was also in Complete Divine or something. That's where I saw it. Hmm. See, I thought it was in uh, Complete Miniature Book or something. I had like a red spine. I need to organize these books. They're not organized. Anyways. Remember, because I took them all down. Uh, when we did our all books ranked, when I moved everything on my shelf to install the lights. Um, <laughs> a corner ducking aura beast. Um, I mean, it was it was okay. There was actually some really cool classes that came out in late third edition. Um, there was like the dragon shaman. Does anybody remember that class? There was um, the hex blade. Remember that class? These all came out like late three point five. There was like dra dragon shaman, hex blade, um, the 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 incarnate, the incarnate. Um, those were like, there was all these classes that came out right at the end of third edition. Um, and uh, I, I remember them being, uh, most of them being pretty, pretty cool. Um, I mean, KC, thanks for hanging out, man. Yeah, we're just shooting the shit now. I figure we'll just go to 10 o'clock here and and we'll call it a night. So, um, yeah, Dra Dragon Shaman was cool. I think that was from Player's Handbook 2, I want to say. Um, but, uh, Incarnum was a funny system. The classes were bad, but the subsystem was cool. That is kind of my remembrance of Incarnum as well. The idea of Incarnum basically being spell like abilities that create temporary magical items was really, really cool. And I thought that was really, really awesome. But I remember the classes feeling a little, a little underbaked. Yeah. Yeah. PHP two, PHP two was sweet. Man, third, third. Third edition was pretty good, man. Three point five. There was some good stuff there. They're really and like at the end of the they they came up with some cool stuff. Do you remember uh, legacy weapons? And remember how you could like take levels in your weapon? 
You know, remember that legacy weapons? I think that was from, yeah, I think it's from the book weapons of legacy. Like it was like, it was like a crazy cool. Like, granted, that's like how they balanced you having like this broken ass item, you know, trying to keep the game somewhat balanced. It's like, oh, my this buddy, my person over here is level 14 wizard and that's a level 14 ranger. And you're like, I'm a level uh, 10 fighter and I have four levels in my sweet ass sword. <laughs> um, um, yeah, <laughs> third, third edition is the best girl. I mean. Uh, I, I can't say whether or not it was a, uh, oh, there we go. There we go. Beguiler, Dragon Shield, Dusk Blade, and Knight. Yes. Yes. Knight was a cool class. That was definitely a proto warlord. And Beguiler was cool. That was a really cool class. Yeah. But Dragon Shaman, I think, was the coolest out of the four of those. Dusk Knight or Dusk Blade, I think, was like the first true non prestige class gish. But I think you had to be an elf only to be a Dusk Blade. This is all just literally, I don't even know what part of my brain this is coming from, but, or maybe it was tied to elves, but you didn't have to necessarily be an elf. I don't remember, but PHP two was sweet. Um, yeah, I'm too old. I'm too old for, I'm too old for Pathfinder two, honestly. Like <laughs> there, there's so <laughs> There's so much stuff going on. Even when you play on Foundry, there's so much stuff going on. It's like, oh, it's like, it's tough. It's tough to keep track. And like these books, man, there's so many words. And like now the remaster's out. And so like, it's all different. And like, I don't, everything I've learned is like, I'm, I'm questioning it. <laughs> there we go. Um. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the existential crisis part of the night. Listen, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to keep it positive. I mean, at this point, I'm sure we've lost everybody. Um, yeah, no, we're still sticking around at fifty. Um, yeah, so it it it's a great game, but Pathfinder Two. But I, I will fully admit that it is it is aimed at a player demographic that I don't know that I'm I'm in right now. Maybe I will be in the future, but and this is me being completely honest about the game. Like, I think the game is totally, totally fine. But I think Pathfinder 2 apply appeals to one of two players. One, and I think they both have to do a lot with Path Builder. And I mean this in like a nice way, but like they they have people who go, I want to make, I have this really interesting idea of almost like a slice of life concept. And I want to be able to re represent that in mechanical terms. And I want to be able to have feats and things on my character sheet that really show that my character is uh, this thing. You know, that's not me. So alternatively, we have people who go, I just want an excuse to get my build online. And like, we could just fight literally a string of ever increasing monsters and in like relatively white rooms, one after another, I would actually probably be okay with that just to see my, character level go up and get new feats and try out the new build and watch as my different powers and feats to come online and see how effective that is. But if you want to, you know, wrap those string of combat encounters into some sort of guise of, you know, with wrappings of a little bit more plot and a little bit of more uh, uh, nuance and some NPCs and characters like I'm cool with that. Just understand that that's not really what I'm here for. I'm kind of here to just like see my character progress and get online. And I, and I think this is like, you know, I think of, I think of like the way that people play, like, uh, you know, world Warcraft, like there's a lot of people who go, yeah, I, I just right click through the quests, you know, like I'm, it's cool, whatever they're there, but I'm just here to level up and get my talent build online and, 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 you know, do that. Um, so <laughs> we did option two in, in, in Northern region, we call it Northman. Karama, you are 100% correct. And also Northman has been very, very, very popular because people go yeah this is cool like i can quickly level up a character i can just go in have a little bit of a little bit of a fight a little bit of a skill check and maybe do a little bit of role playing and boom boom we're on to the next thing and yeah it's been very popular we've had uh, an unbelievable amount of games yeah uh, you you should know that <laughs> because uh you know you're uh, you're uh, in in a lot of those <laughs> um i think i'm assuming you were part of that we had somebody go from level one to 10 in one day, I think. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, Kyle, this is, this. 
I've had this problem as well because I, I have been in that spot, you know, where I, I some, I do love crunch. Like, cause, cause the truth of the matter is when I go and play like this really super hardcore indie storytelling game, I, 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 I miss I miss some of the crunchy elements. Like I, I do like mechanics. I do like games. I like board games. I, um, this is all my RPGs, but on the other side of this wall, I have just as big of a thing, but it's full of board games. I love board games. Um, I love mechanics. I love magic, the gathering, right? So obviously I like games, uh, but you know, crunch plus story is tough. And, and I, I think a lot of us are sort of in this weird limbo right now where we're bouncing around. We're trying different games We're we're looking at stuff like, 13th age or maybe Lancer or or icon or beacon, or is it fourth edition or is it Pathfinder two? Or is it, you know, we're, we're looking for something that is going to sort of deliver. Is it, is it Matt Colville DM, uh, you know, game, you know, we're looking for something that'll sort of kind of fill that, but you know, uh, yes, (laughs) you did run those games. Okay. I, I, I saw the GM log and I thought it was you who did that. Um, but I, I am, I'm burnt out on the only crunch and Isaiah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, e- even these games, like so many of these games just are well-intended, you know, I've seen a lot of well-intended Pathfinder two campaigns and games just, you know, by the third or fourth or fifth sex session, people are just like, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, what do we got there? Two ogres. All right. Um, uh, well, I'll go attack the one on the left. I'll strike over and I'll strike. Um, let's see, I got 27, so, uh, hit, yep, and then, uh, uh, I guess map attack, like, and that's, like, that becomes the game, like, at a certain point, and, like, a lot of the night is that, or waiting 10 to 15 minutes to get your chance to do that, that's not great for me, I, some people love it. I don't know, you know, and some GMs are way better than me. So they're, they're bringing the fire. They're making it cool. They're making the intensity, but it's tough. It's tough for me. Um, so, um, let's see here. Happy. I kept all my four eBooks <laughs> dungeons and dread in the dark. I think solves all of our problems. Uh, not quite. <laughs> It comes close. Um, you know, again, there's a lot I love about Powered by the Apocalypse games. There's a lot I love about uh, um, Blades in the Dark, Forge in the Dark games. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, like, there, there is something about them that, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like D&D, and that's kind of the problem. So it's weird. I don't know. It, it's, a, it's, a tough pro- it's a tough spot to be in. Um, <laughs> it was so fun. It was literally a serious troll. Okay. It was literally a serious troll. And yet Vin's like, it was amazing. And Kyle's like, it looked like it was so great. Uh, Isaiah, thank you for the ob- obligatory XKCD, uh, uh, reference here. Right. Um, no. Ryan, Ryan is of course correct here. There is no one perfect system or setting. And when I say that, I mean, for me, I mean, for where I'm at right now in my life, um, about what I want on a game, you know, um, because I said before, like I'm, I'm, I'm a recovering spike, right? I'm an, I'm a recovering spike who for the first time ever is kind of embracing his inner Timmy and saying, you know what? I just want these games to be fun. And there's no doubt to me. Like, you know, this is like Mark, what Mark Rosewater was talking about, about how people think he's like, people think that they make their choices intellectually, but they actually make their choices emotionally. I like to think that I have enough self-awareness and self-control that this is actually fucking me because these two conflicting desires are like battling in my brain because I want to make intellectual choices. I like intellectual choices, but my heart, that's my brain, but my heart is telling me. I'm not going to be satisfied with that. And so every time I sit down to play something like Bob's birthday bash, which was a Patreon exclusive video, if you didn't see it, Bob's birthday bash, uh, dread in the dark and dragons. Um, uh, when we play dungeon time extreme, 
which again was like Dread in the Dark and Dragons. It was called Dungeon Time Extreme. It was literally a meme serious troll of kicking in the door and killing the monsters in, you know, using like a very hacked up fifth edition rule set. All of those games were a blast. They were so fun. The emotional Derek was so satisfied, but intellectual Derek was like, where's the compelling gameplay? Where's the, where's the intellectual puzzle to solve? And it's like, shut up, dude, you suck. Every time you get what you want, we're bored out of our minds, but I can't shut them up. I can't shut the inner intellectual me up. And that's, that's the, that's the problem. We really are in the existential crisis part of the stream. <laughs> um, Bruno says, I've been following the MCDM development, and I feel like it's going to be one of those games that is super and cool and well done, but it's going to suffer from this doesn't feel like D&D phenomena. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that might not matter to me as much, but I, I think that it's going to hamper it a lot. I think I think it's going to hamper Daggerheart as well, to be honest with you. Um, I'm wondering... If Dungeon Coaches, you know, normally I would just completely dismiss anything that Dungeon Coach did out of hand, but I watched a video where I think Treant Monk was going over the Dungeon uh, DC 20 system, and it really did. I was like, wow, this guy really did just steal from 4th edition, 5th edition, and Pathfinder 2. Um, and uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, but in an interesting way. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe maybe this actually will be pretty cool. So I think, like, I'm not really, I don't really care too much about, like, the Cobalt Press stuff because... That's like two fifth edition for me, but I would say right now, the three kind of potential heartbreaker, I'm going to call them heartbreakers. They may not want to think of them as heartbreakers. I consider them heartbreakers. The three heartbreakers that I'm really watching right now are Matt Colville, the game system, Dagger Heart, and this uh, DC 20 system. I think, I think they might, might be something I, I, I'd be interested in taking a look at. Um, Yes. I, yes, to be clear, that absolutely is what happened with Dungeon Time Extreme as well. I was literally trying to control the people who are playing it. And, and, and like, like, for example, I, I, I'm like this, this literally became like a rule in our game where like, uh, we had like three dwarves in the party. Cause everyone was like, it's, we're playing old school D and D being a dwarf is fucking sweet. And I was like, oh, lo, does the power of the dwarf almost come to fruition? And everyone's like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, don't you know? Legends speak that should four dwarves ever be in the same place at once, which has never happened before. Because literally, we've never had four dwarves in a party. I was like, should four dwarves ever be in a party? They would be able to call upon the power of the elements. And so when our buddy Kaz joined the campaign, like a couple sessions later, they were like, he was like, oh, Fuck yeah, I'll make a I'll make a dwarf. So suddenly they had four dwarves, right? I had a, I had a money up. So I was like, oh okay, well, all right. As dwarves, like once a day, you can combine your energy and summon an earth elemental. And they were like, sweet. So they summoned an earth elemental. And then I was like, oh yeah, but you don't control it. And they were like, shit. And so the earth elemental just starts attacking them. And then they kill it. And they were like, oh well, that kind of sucked. And I was like, yeah, but its heart is a big, huge, glowing diamond worth a bunch of money. And everyone was like, huzzah! And they were all cheering. And they were like, oh, this is gonna be awesome and broken. We're going to be able to like make use of this to get a lot of treasure and level up because treasure was goal, uh, treasure was XP in that game. But then the legends hold true because because of scheduling conflicts, it was a very drop in drop out type game. They literally throughout the rest of the entire campaign only had one other session where all four players who were playing dwarves were present. So it didn't become broken because it literally was really impossible to get, or really hard to get four dwarves together at once. But every time they had four dwarves together at once, they would summon an earth elemental so they could fight it for its diamond heart and sell it and get a bunch of gold and, and experience. Anyways, that's an example of where I was like, I was just trying to make fun of them and come up with a funny, but everyone loved it. They were like, oh, this is such a cool cool strategy like really adds to the dwarfs culture in this world uh anyways um intellectual derek sucks yeah In intellectual derek gets paid well from his job but yes intellectual derek when it comes to like rpg time is a problem oh <sighs> all right um yeah, uh, I don't know what the actual name of the system is. It, it's from the guy called the Dungeon Coach. Who? Some of the stuff he's come up with has been a little sus, but this seems interesting. I mean, he seems to have, have gotten something right. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, we need a fifth dwarf, and that would just be too much. Um, so, yeah, I think it's called just DC20. But I don't know if there's a whole lot of information out there unless you're, like, maybe a member of his Patreon or something. But um, it should be interesting. All right, everybody. We've we've gone off the reservation here enough. Um, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Thank you for the incredible support. Um, Ryan, self-confessed cynic. Trey, Mass Fam, Ayla, GM Scott, negative. Thank you for your support tonight. Um, appreciate all the love. Not a single tip, but in this in this case, it is well it is well is well appreciated because everybody's saying, "Hey, you know what? Take a break. I get to have a holiday, so that'll be a lot of fun." Thank you. Um, you know, all this support helps. Uh, keeps you know our uh, our our foundry server or forge servers humming our foundry servers going the bots running um and uh it'll be it'll be great so uh thanks everybody for hanging out with me tonight uh if you're a member of the patreon uh i look forward to uh you know continuing some conversations of, about some of these ideas over the next couple of uh days as we always tend to do and uh you know hopefully at some point we can learn enough about game design that maybe there will be such a thing as Nightfinder. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time on Nights of Last Call. Peace out.